One, two, three, four. Cressy's here. It's no Cressy's here. Yeah. <laughs> so we have communications from Lower Student School. Some pilots. Okay. okay. Good morning, everyone. I'd uh, basically like to call the meeting to order. Okay. Good. So uh, welcome to meeting number 10 of the Economic and Community Development uh, Committee. Uh, welcome to the committee members and uh, to visiting members of council in attendance with us today, uh, to the members of the public and also to the media. Uh, I'd just like to advise everyone that you can follow the agenda and debate on your uh, computer, your tablets and or smartphone at www.toronto.ca backslash council. The Economic and Community Development Committee acknowledges the land that we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississauga of the um, Credit, the Anishwabi, the Chippewa, and the Haudenosaunee, and the Windet uh, people, and is home to many diverse uh, First Nations, Inuit, Métis people, we acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty Number 13 with the Mississauga of the Credit. And so, members, just moving right along with respect to the agenda. Are there any uh, conflict of interest on the, the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? Seeing none, thank you. The confirmation of the minutes of the November 6th meeting, Councillor Lai. All those in favor, oppose that, it's carried. Oh, that's right, you weren't here, okay. So, but, um, Councillor Ford, thank you very much. I saw a twitch there, and I thought, okay. <laughs> um, we have a number of uh, speakers, we have a list, and I know that there has been some additional correspondence that the clerk has placed on members' uh, desk. If uh, there's any issues relating to those, uh, please advise me, um, but I think we sh should be good, so communications and report. Um, just before I begin, uh, I, oh, there he is. Uh, I just wanted to acknowledge the uh, general manager and uh, his team. On Monday, the general manager and his team held the signature event at uh, Hotel X. And I just wanted to commend the general manager and deputy um, uh, city manager um, for the outstanding work that the team did in assembling a great group of uh, business leaders in the city. Um, the response and the uh, feedback of we've had has been absolutely tremendous. We went this morning to the mayor's um, uh, um, speech this morning at the Canadian Club uh, about uh, building up Toronto and a number of business leaders who attended Monday's event were in attendance and uh, they conveyed uh, to me and I've asked me to convey through to you uh, what an amazing event it was, and they really thank you. So thank you very much for a great event. Okay, uh, moving right along with the agenda, EC 10.1. Um, what say you, members, with respect to EC 10.1? I don't have... Okay, go ahead. Councilor Cressy, EC, welcome, Deputy... Uh, with Vice Chair Grimes, thank you very much. Good to see um, Councilor Ainsley as visiting member. And um, uh, EC 10.1, allocation of um, capacity building and youth um, identity uh, impact grant. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm happy to move the recommendations. And just to note, I heard from Councilor Carroll just now who has the stomach flu. Yes, we just heard that for the clerk, so thank you. Okay, so all those in favor, those that's carried, thank you. Uh, EC 10.2, engagement um, of not-for-profit organization to provide monitoring of programs. We have a speaker on this particular item, so I will hold. Um, EC 10.3, Central Etobicoke Community Hub Planning Update. I know that uh, Deputy Mayor Holiday is here on that, and we also have a speaker, Colin Meng, is here as well. Dr. Meng is here, so I will hold that item. Uh, EC 10.4, uh, extending purchase order number 60415, 
4869 uh, for uh, longitudinal, um, no, actually, I'm gonna hold that if you don't mind. <laughs> I just finished reading it on the impact of childcare fee subsidies. I'm gonna hold that, I just have a few questions. Um, EC 10.5, Region Park Swim Pilot and Engagement Efforts Status Update. We have a number of speaker on that item, so will be holding that item. Uh, EC 10.6, um, expansion of the Toronto Fire Service Data Portal. Uh, what say you members? Okay, um, Vice Chair Grimes is moving the item. All those in favor, opposed, that's carried. Thank you very much, Vice Chair Grimes. Uh, EC 10.7, pilot um, a mediation referral program update. What say members? Movers, it's, it is here for information. Vice Chair Grimes, are you moving it? Okay, uh, thank you very much. All those in favor, opposed, that carries. EC 10.8, uh, Senior Services and Long-Term Care Implementation Plan and Update. We have speakers on this particular item, so we'll be holding that in my name. Uh, EC 10.9, Amendment to Blanket Contract Number 4702-1306, uh, issued to GFS, uh, Gordon Food Services, Canada Limited, for the provision of groceries to long-term care Homes. Councillor Cressy moving the item. All those in favor, opposed, that's carried. Thank you. Um, EC 10.10, .10, amendment to various purchase orders and blanket contracts for short term and emergency hotel, motel accommodation for shelter clients. Uh, Council, okay, Councillor Cressy would like to hold. Is it ready or no? It's not ready. Okay, fair enough. We will hold it down, absolutely. Um, EC 10.11, 2019 third quarter status report on audit recommendationing, uh, recommendations opening doors to stable housing. Let's see. Uh, Councillor Lai is moving the item. All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Thank you very much. Uh, EC 10.12, which is the uh, Econo Toronto Economic Bulletin. Okay, move receipt. Um, Vice Chair Grimes is moving receipt. All those, move, it's adopt the item actually. So move adoption of the item. All those in favor? Opposed, that's carried, thank you. EC 10.13, promoting culinary experience in Scarborough. Um, the item is here for information. All those in favor? Opposed, that's carried, thank you. EC, uh, Council Cressy. Cressy? Yes, Council Cressy. You move that right. EC 10.14, appointments to Rogers Road BIA, B Business Improvement Area, Board of Management. Okay, who's, uh, those in favor? Opposed, that's carried, thank you. EC 10.15, intends uh, to designate the Lawrence Ingram Keel Business Improvement Area. All those in favor, those in favor, opposed, carried, thank you very much. Vice Chair Grimes, you're just ready to go. I'm happy to see <laughs> you. Yeah, that's right, moving and shaking. Uh, EC 10.16, Business Improvement Area BIA 2020, Operating Budgets Report number one. Uh, okay, Councilor Cressy's moving the item. All those in favor, opposed, that's carried. Thank you very much. Uh, EC 10.17, Response to Partnership that Produces Best Practices for International Metropolitan Agreements. All those in favor? Opposed, that's carried, thank you. EC 10.18, uh, city-owned um, space for do-it-yourself events. All those in favor? Opposed, uh, that's carried. That, that comes, I think, from your committee, um, Councillor Cressy, that's great, thank you. Um, EC 10.19, strategies for assigning, assisting live, live Music venues, all those in favor? Opposed, that's carried. Thank you very much, Councillor Cressy. You guys have been busy. Oh, sure, not at all. Okay, so we let's reopen. All those in favor, reopening, okay. Opposed, that carries. All right, so a recorded vote on EC 10.19. Um, Madam Clerk? All those in
Motion to adopt uh, um, item 19. All those in favor? Councillor Cressy, Councillor Grimes, Councillor Thompson, Councillor Ford, and Councillor Lai. The motion carries. Okay, thank you very much. That's unanimous. Councillor Cressy. Uh, EC 10.12 Sustainability Options for Power Access and Solid Waste Management of the Film Industry. Okay, all those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Okay. Okay, final item is uh, EC 10.12. I'm just going to hold that one down. It's a Rivertown Social uh, Development Coordinator. I'm just going to hold that in that uh, Councillor Fletcher may come in to speak to that. And I know that she was at the breakfast this morning. I'm not sure if she's back just yet. So I'll hold that down in my name. Are we good? Okay, fantastic. Okay, members, um, I'm just going to ask um, that we bury the agenda and um, allow for us to, which would allow for us to deal with uh, item EC 10.3. The deputy mayor has uh, 10 o'clock he needs to get to in order to uh, be on time. I'd like to ask that we vary the agenda and deal with this item. Then we go back to the first item that is listed on the agenda for speakers, which was EC 10.2, engagement of not-for-profit organization to provide mentoring program for children age 7 to 11. All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Okay. Thank you. So we are going to deal with um, EC 10.3, Central Etobicoke uh, Community Hub Planning Update. I have a speaker, uh, Dr. Meng, calling Meng. Would you come forward, please? Um, I'm not sure if you've been to the committees before. I don't recall seeing you at my committee. But great. Well, thank you very much. It's always nice to have uh, someone in for the first time. You'll have five minutes to, to speak, sir. Uh, there is a clock uh, to your left, my right. There's one behind you as well, but I'm sure you can see the one to your left much better than the one behind you. You'll have five minutes to speak, and thereafter, members of committee uh, may ask you a question up to five minutes. And um, if, uh, if they don't ask you any question, that would conclude your presentation. All right? So thank you very much. Let me just see if I can get... I haven't touched the clock yet, but it seems to be moving without my involvement. Okay, so you may begin when you're ready, sir. Okay, members of the Economic and Community Development Committee, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak to you today about item EC 10.3, Central Etobicoke Community Hub Planning. My name is Dr. Colin Mang, and I'm here today both as a resident of Ward 2 and to represent the Central Etobicoke Community Hub Initiative. The CECH Initiative is a community action committee made up of local residents and not-for-profit service organizations. Our mission is to advocate for new community facilities and services in Central Etobicoke in order to close the gaps identified in the report presented to you today. We can be found online at etobicohub.org. Our organization holds community forums in Ward 2 four times per year, which give residents an opportunity to meet with local service providers and public officials to discuss local issues affecting residents of Etobicoke. Our most recent forum, held on November 19th, featured Susan Oakler, the City of Toronto Ombudsman, as a featured guest, while our forum this past September filled the Nielsen Park Creative Centre to its seating capacity for an update on progress towards creating a central Etobicoke community hub, which followed this committee's request for this report. Our organization has been featured on the front page of the Etobicoke Guardian and on the front page of the Toronto Star's GTA section. To date, we have secured over 30 not-for-profit agencies interested in participating in a future Central Etobicoke Community Hub. On behalf of the Central Etobicoke Community Hub Initiative and our agency partners, I would like to thank this committee for the grant which made possible the CECH feasibility study. I would like to thank the staff at Social Development, Finance and Administration, CreateTO, and Parks, Forestry and Recreation for the efforts they have devoted thus far to this important community project. This report notes that Central Etobicoke contains large populations of seniors and youths, as well as many low-income households. This report also notes that Central Etobicoke residents have access to fewer local services than other areas of the city, despite large higher-needs populations. On September 5th, 
This committee requested SDFA, CreateTO, and PFR to report on the investment funding grant approved in 2016, the Central Etobicoke Community Hub Initiative, and on opportunities to co-locate a multi-agency-led service provision model at City of Toronto-owned redevelopment sites in Ward 2. This report lists two sites in Ward 2, a proposed PFR facility and 399 the West Mall, as well as two sites in Ward 3 in close proximity to the Ward boundary. The report concludes that the central Etobicoke area would benefit from an increase in services and that new community space opportunities should be sought. We are grateful that SDFA has acknowledged the service deficit, and we are grateful that this report recommends that new community space opportunities should be sought for our community. However, what would really benefit the residents of Ward 2 is an explanation of how one of the sites listed could deliver the multi-agency-led service provision model that has been the subject of this committee's study. This report clearly identifies the need for expanded service provision and recommends that new facilities be sought. And this report identifies new community space developments within the City of Toronto's portfolio. What this report does not clearly do is link one assessment to the other. Therefore, I would like to raise the following questions. Given the demonstrated need and the recommendation for community space and improved service provision contained in this report, and given the identified sites within the city's development portfolio in Ward 2, what can be done to address the issue that first came before this committee in 2016, the establishment of a central Etobicoke community hub? Which of these sites presents the best candidate, the best opportunity for development of a hub? I hope that the committee will reflect on these questions carefully in your consideration of the report. Thank you for your time and for your consideration. Thank you very much, Dr. May. Um, questions? Uh, visiting Councillor Holliday. Um, thank you, Deputy Mayor Chair. Um, thanks for talking to us, Colin. Um, I, uh, I wonder if you could just mention a little bit about the group. So you've got a large, if you can confirm, that you've got a large number of volunteers that have, you've essentially written a white paper. And, and could you tell us a little bit about the analysis that you did to reach the conclusions about the deficit of services? Sure. So the analysis we did made use of data from the City of Toronto, which is available at toronto.ca slash wellbeing and lists all of the uh, you know, available services in the area. Uh, on our website at etobicohub.org, you can see the service map and you can also see it on the city's website that Ward 2 is a gigantic service gap. Uh, we lack community centers, we lack not-for-profit agencies, we lack community space uh, for agencies to de deliver programming. We have no community health centers for a community of 118,000 people. Uh, the report that was prepared made use of 17 focus groups, it made use of an online survey, uh, and it made use of key informant interviews as well. Uh, the report took about a year, uh, during which we visited other areas of the city as well, uh, to meet with community groups across the city, to tour community hubs, uh, such as the Rexdale Community Hub, and to tour other uh, parks, forestry, and recreation community centres, such as Wellesley, to see the types of services that are offered. Uh, to meet with uh, Toronto Public Libraries and to meet with various departments within the City of Toronto to find out what services are available elsewhere that are not being delivered in our community. Now, you work with a lot of service providers in this yes, process. Um, could you comment, um, these aren't brand new service providers that aren't in existence. A lot of these are agencies that have established themselves in the Etobicoke area at large, but are looking to put satellite services or sub-offices in central Etobicoke because they know the need. Yes, that's correct. So there are some organizations based locally, such as Etobicoke Services for Seniors, but there are also other organizations based elsewhere in Etobicoke. Uh, so we work with the Rexdale Community Health Centre, as well as Stonegate Community Health Centre and Lamp Community Health Centre located in South Etobicoke. Uh, we also work with um, we have a, a variety of other organizations, Medanta Community Services, which does some work uh, in the North York area, as well as they have some branch programming in, in North Etobicoke. Uh, the Daily Bread Food Bank uh, is involved in our project. We also have um, Humber College, 
We have a variety of other organizations as well that operate in other parts of Etobicoke but would like to expand service provision in central Etobicoke. The George Hall Center, for one, which had space in central Etobicoke, but uh, the building that they were in uh, was torn down for redevelopment, and so they don't have uh, programming space available so in our the, community anymore. So the George Hall is a great example of a situation that was the, the, the baseline or the, the base finding of the report was around mobility. So yes. in central Etobicoke, we especially concentrated on the 427 highway. We've got a lot of need, and the issue is is getting to the services in North Etobicoke, South Etobicoke, out in Mississauga if you need to go to certain medical services. Um, taking public transit is not an easy thing. And you know, you're, you're talking 30, 45 minutes to move around on buses to get to a simple appointment. And uh, could you just make a last question here, a brief comment on the report's finding about the criti critical nature of mobility within Central Etobicoke and hence the need to look at a hub which is centrally located. Yeah, Central Etobicoke has the lowest degree of walkability of anywhere in the city, it has the lowest density. It's primarily low density residential. And this presents a large problem given that there are 27,000 senior citizens, the largest of any ward uh, in the city. Uh, having to go to one place for one appointment, another place to another appointment, particularly if you're not able to drive, places an enormous burden on citizens who may have to commute you know, up to an hour, hour and a half in between appointments. The idea of having a central facility that co-locates services uh, reduces the burden placed on residents in terms of travel. Seeking a central facility which is easily accessible both by car and also by public transit uh, would be a substantial benefit and a substantial improvement so that seniors within our community, 118,000 people, 27,000 seniors, uh, would not have to travel 30, 40 minutes up to an hour to access services in other parts of the city. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Mayor Holliday. Any further questions? Okay, and seeing no other visiting member, I'm, I'm coming to you, Councillor Grimes, please slow down. Um, we'll bring this matter into committee. Uh, Councillor Grimes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So the three sites listed in the uh, report, you've got the report, I guess two and three would probably be the best two to be looking at. And, and what you're saying, not to put words in your mouth, is like we have a great opportunity here sites controlled by the city, owned by the city, this is a great opportunity for us to, to look at this hub. Yes, definitely. Uh, I mean, I think the report did a good job of identifying sites that are available. Uh, contained within the feasibility study, there is, uh, these sites were listed, uh, but what is lacking from the report is a clear, uh, a clear linkage between the need and between these sites. So the report lists that there is a need, the report lists that there are you know, city-owned sites available for redevelopment, but what the report does not do is make that linkage, uh, which of the sites would actually be a good candidate for this hub. Yeah, and on that, so if you took the sites one, two, and three, mm. I guess if you put them in reverse order, three, two, one, three being, you know, one probably being furthest away from making things happen in the very near future, it'd be probably three, two, one, correct? And in, in your site locations? Uh, well, I mean, in, in terms of, you know, the availability of locations, so there are three locations reported there. Uh, in terms of construction timelines, I, I think your uh, comment is accurate in terms of which facility might be finished first. That's not necessarily the facility that might provide the best overall services. I think that's something that really needs to be considered carefully, is which of the sites would provide the best service. Um, given that you know we're talking many years into the future for any potential redevelopment site, I think we need to consider what is the optimal location for this hub that's gonna be able to provide the best service uh, to the community. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vice Chair Grimes. Anyone else? No? Okay, thank you very much, sir, for your thank presentation. You. Uh, questions of staff? Anyone wishes to question staff? Okay, seeing none. Uh, to speak, Deputy Mayor Holliday. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just, I wanna thank staff, first of all, uh, for preparing this report. Um, quite a bit of work went into this from the community, uh, from experts in the community, really. It just, it just wasn't, um, you know, something that was uh, worked on Google Docs. There was a lot of people that put hours into this. The committee continues to meet. Um, it, is, it is quite a motivated group with a lot of uh, specialty expertise in it. And I would implore you to go have a look at the white paper they wrote because 
it is literally a blueprint for how to put um, a, a center together. Um, I am going to. I am going to recommend to the committee that a motion be placed uh, to refer the item back for some additional reporting um, because I think there's more to talk about on a community hub. Um, we pulled just a few, uh, MM41-23, um, a hub on uh, at Sir Robert L. Borden Business um, and Technical Institute, another one MM5-20 at uh, Vaughan Road Academy, uh, MM3.12 about uh, community hubs and schools, it's not a new concept for the City of Toronto. Um, it is something that is relatively new for Central Etobicoke. I wanted to make a note though. Um, there are three locations that are cited in the report. One, two, and three. The first one being the Etobicoke Civic Centre. Um, locations two and three aren't even in Ward 2. So it's just, it's one location there. Um, the others are, are somewhat nearby and accessible by transit and they, it is true they're around the Islington City Centre and they're uh, being looked at for, for development but this all comes down to one really important theme and it's mobility. Um, the George Hall Centre I asked Dr. Mang about, it was an example of a, a place that offers very specialized services to youth um, and it had to move because of a development and the clients that we're going to that place, it was, it was a place accessible in the neighborhood. Now it is a very difficult travel. And if you're a mom with a stroller with a, with a young person and another child, um, imagine how to take two or three buses to get to a medical appointment. Well, you know what happens after time is you, you just don't make those appointments. Um, so there's a, there's a ton of community organizations, uh, many I've talked to and many that Dr. Meng has that said, look, if we had a place to go, we would be there in a heartbeat in a heartbeat, and we could easily assemble a hub. The other thing about Central Etobicoke you gotta think about is that the amount of development in churn is different than, let's say, the inner part of the city. So opportunities to arise to install a hub of this size are few and far between. Um, there's one, the Stonegate Community Health Center, which is well down in the south end of Etobicoke. Uh, great place, great model, it's 15,000 square feet. Um, Dr. Mang, uh, his assessment arrived at about 50,000 square feet. It would be an ideal world to host the type of things that we could easily fill a hub with. Um, the problem is there aren't very many developments that are of scale that a community benefit of 50,000 square feet could come out of. So there's a lot more thinking that needs to go on. Um, the report does talk a little bit about some of the work being done from a parks, forestry and recreation perspective. Um, I want to be cautious about that. Uh, you know, we're, we're really glad and, and lucky to have the ability to have a, a, another pool and another gymnasium built in central Etobicoke because we need them, there's a deficit, but I don't want to conflate the two. We're talking about a broader range of services in a hub, which is um, different than what we do from a recreation programming perspective. Those spaces just aren't available in the suburbs uh, due to the history and the way that we evolved. Um, and the thinking of this has to be extremely cognizant about bus routes and the way people move around in this part of the city. You literally take a map of the bus routes and overlay them and find the critical places. So I, I'm, I'm going to make a request to the committee that this be sent back to staff for some further work. I want to look more at the feasibility about this and I'd like to know more about what the city can do to support this process and who the other stakeholders are. And I recognize it's a large thing to ask for but my job as a councillor and our job as council is to try to set those conditions right for the evolution of these entities because the services are so badly needed and we've got service providers ready to go. They just need to make it happen at the right nexus point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Mayor Holliday. Uh, further speak, Councillor Grimes, are you speaking on this item? Uh, I'll just speak very briefly to support my colleague, uh, Councillor Holliday, and thanks to the doctor for coming down. He mentioned all the uh, the great groups that do great work in, in our community, uh, LAMP, Stonegate, uh, Togo Senior for the Service, they've all come to me, um, Storefront Hover, they're all looking for additional spaces. So this is a, an opportunity that's uh, coming to the forefront. Uh, I think uh, uh, we should be looking at this seriously, but everyone's looking for more space and, uh, and, and, the, and, the, and the need is getting greater and greater. So um, I'll be supporting my uh, colleague, uh, Deputy Mayor Holiday. Thank you very much, um, Deputy Mayor, uh, Vice Chair. Um, Councillor Ford, wish to speak. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and maybe I'll just put in North Etobicoke's uh, two cents into this, um, and uh, no doubt uh, support uh, for this and for the work the, uh, the steering committee is doing and the community group. I know um, one of my uh, first uh, meetings as a city councillor 
uh, for North Etobo a couple of years back was with the group um, or some representatives of the uh, Central Etobicoke uh, group that's moving this forward. Um, like um, Councillor Grimes, we have heard the same thing in North Etobicoke and we've been trying to work on some stuff too, especially with our, with our city staff on how we get more supports for these groups who are doing phenomenal work uh, in our communities. Uh, so no doubt I'll be also supporting uh, the request and I'm happy to move it unless uh, I think the chair might be moving a, a referral back to staff, but uh, if not, I'm happy to move the motion. Thank you. Much, uh, Councillor Ford. All right, so I'm just going to speak just to move the motion for Deputy Mayor Holliday. Uh, certainly in, in document, um, I know we chatted a little earlier this morning. Um, I, I wanna thank the staff for the report and it's um, really important in terms of our recognition that there is always a variety of different ways and options in terms of dealing with matters and so on. And so in as much as it is, it seems that what's being said here this morning, it's not complete. And I think that we need to ensure uh, for the success of um, obviously the community and the needs in terms of responding to the needs of the community, we need to take the time and do it right. And so this is why I'm moving the motion, which is on the screen, it says um, the item be, ref that the item be, be for referred back to the executive director, social development and finance administration for further consideration and report back to the committee in 2020 on the feasibility of a hub in central Etobicoke with additional information on the opportunity and roles of the city and other stakeholders in the development and sustain, sustainment of a community hub. Uh, I'd just like to, 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 to do the following, uh, Deputy Mayor Holliday, if you could. I think that 2020 is a long period of time and I think that we perhaps should maybe put a better marker in there in terms of maybe second quarter, would that be okay? So the second quarter, in, uh, in 2020, so I'll amend it uh, just to reflect that and then at least give staff sort of some real timelines in terms of bringing it back so we can discuss it and we can fine tune it and uh, obviously ensure that the refresh will address and acknowledge the concerns of the community and so on, all right? So, uh, maybe just uh, take a second just to adjust that. I'm just going to say that like the second quarter of 2020, I'm not gonna give the specific month, but just the second quarter so we can come back and we can deal with it. Madam Lucien, do you see? Right, okay, and then maybe the, the DCM I just pointed out to me, which is extremely important, that um, we would say in terms of the um, executive director's social development finance, but also in consultation with Create TO, yeah. their landowners there, right? So, the, okay, so that's really important for us to incorporate all that element in it. So in consultation with Create TO. All right, so the clerk is uh, just finalizing that and uh, I just wanna make sure it's in order here and then we can vote on it. And then up next will be uh, EC 10.2, engagement of not, um, not-for-profit organizations to provide uh, um, mentoring programs for, ages, for uh, children ages uh, seven to 11. Uh, Madam Clerk, are we good? So, okay, right, okay. Members, the motion's on the, on the screen. Um, if you are if you read it and you're fine with it, I will then ask for the vote. All those in favor, oppose, that carries. Thank you. Dr. Mank, Mank thank you very much. And very uh, much. we look forward to seeing you again in the committee. All right, um, moving right along, members, we are now moving to, um, yes, EC 10.2, uh, engagement of not-for-profit organization to provide mentoring programs for children's age seven to 11, update. Um, Leanne Nicole, uh, no stranger to this committee. She is um, uh, the CEO of, of uh, Big Brothers and Sisters of Toronto. Good morning and welcome, Ms. Nicole. Good to see you again. Thank you. Thank you. And you know the rules, you've got five minutes and you yeah. may be questioned and maybe not be questions for you and so on, but thank you very much for being here this morning. You may begin. Thanks. Thank you. First and foremost, I want to say thank you to the team that put together the report that um, was distributed. I'm really excited that we are going to explore the opportunity to provide natural support for not only hopefully the kids of Scarborough, but this, the children who are in much need of these developmental relationships throughout our city. We do have some initial findings from the work that we are currently doing in Scarborough. And I can assure you there is no shortage of volunteers who are willing to put up their hand to be in the lives of the kids who need it the most. 
We are working with a population of children who have multiple adverse childhood experiences, and what we know is these adverse childhood experiences are leading to toxic stress. Toxic stress leads to very negative long-term outcomes, including poor mental health, poor physical health, and um, uh, ad adverse, uh, sorry, uh, risk-taking behaviors. So we have turned the corner on a lot of the kids' lives that we are currently serving, and what we know is we need to accelerate this. One of the largest things lacking in kids' lives in these vulnerable populations is the positive, caring adult that they need. Many of their supports and adult supports are paid professionals. So they're either social workers, they're mental health professionals, they're teachers, and others that are paid. Oftentimes, the kids that we serve, the only natural support they have outside of their parent guardian is a big brother or a big sister or a developmental relationship in the form of a mentor. And we know that these kids cannot be exposed to the developmental assets that they need over the course of their childhood without a positive, caring adult. There's plenty of research that points in that direction. We have children who have identified off the top. For example, I'll give you one example from a, a young girl in Scarborough, nine years old, who identified, we identified that one of the gap in assets that she had was honesty. She was not being honest with her family, she was not being honest with her teacher, she was not being honest with her social worker from Children's Aid. We put a big sister in her life and we worked on the asset, developmental asset of honesty since September. And last week, she came to her big sister and said, I would like to get the screening report back, that, or, or the, the survey back that I filled out at the beginning of our relationship, because I wasn't honest. And so, that is a clear indicator if we intentionally work on the developmental assets that these kids identify as gaps, we can close the gap and those assets can land. So I'm really grateful that this uh, that the staff put this report together as a recommendation to move forward on building developmental assets in the lives of kids. And what we know is that we can't build developmental assets in the lives of ch children without positive, caring adults. So I'm, thank I'm grateful for you. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Are there any questions, visiting Councillor, Councillor Ainsley? Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Thompson. Uh, through you to the the Deputy, I want to thank you for coming in this morning again. My pleasure. Um, you've read the report. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask about, um, so previously when you've been in, you talked about uh, the cost for, I guess, big brothers, big sisters to deliver a program like this. And I, I seem to recall it was around $1,700 a year. Yes, so it's uh, on average $1,750 um, $1, a year, but the upfront costs on year one because of volunteer screening, police reports, and the intense intake process, it actually is the course of a three-year lifetime is about $7,500. So that is on average what it costs. So $1,750 would be the average in the lifespan of the developmental relationship, which on average lasts three years. Okay, so, and this is calling for a one-year one pilot project, and you're talking about a, a three-year span. I believe it's a two-year pilot project at $175,000 per year. Okay. And in terms of one-to-one uh, -one mentoring in Toronto, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, I'm, I'm sure you study all of that. And do you have any idea, like ballpark, roughly how many um, youth between the ages of 7 and 11, which this pilot would look into? are in need of assistance or mentoring in Toronto? Yes, we recently did a third party feasibility study on the addressable population for our intervention and the feasibility study came back from a third party at 42,000 children. 42,000 children would be, when this project's replicable and it spreads out across the city, there's 42,000 children today that would qualify for this program. That's right, 41,834 to be exact. <laughs> <laughs> And then, um, do you know, we're asking for this pilot project to be done in Scarborough. Do you have any idea what that breaks down to in Scarborough 
in terms of a waiting list or? Yes, our waiting list right now in Scarborough is 70, 79 children and we have not done any outreach to bring, the, the, um, to bring more kids into the intervention because it's a risk to keep them on a waiting list for a longer period of time. Okay, and, and of those children that are in Scarborough, is that um, co-ed, is it a mix of boys and girls or mostly boys? 75% boys. 75% boys, okay, all right. Thank you very much, I appreciate you coming in again this morning. Thank you. Right. Okay, thank you, any, bring the matter into committee, any questions of the speaker? Okay, seeing none, thank you. Uh, to speak, um, visiting I did have Rainsie. some questions of staff. Yeah, oh, questions of staff, okay. questions of staff. Councillor Renzi, go ahead, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure who am I addressing this to. Oh, good morning. Um, I just wanted to ask about the report. Um, so it's a pilot project that we're looking at doing. Um, if you could have advised me of what the timelines, timelines are we're looking for in terms of implementing it and going through the application process. Uh, sh sure. Uh, to the chair, um, we are looking at a Q1 2020 um, uh, date for the call and with um, our intention of starting the program in mid, mid to late Q2 2020. Okay, so first quarter 2020 is when the application will be issued, and from there, how long do you think it'll take to choose a proponent? So it takes um, staff about, uh, we give proponents about four to, applicants, sorry, four to six weeks um, in order for them to respond uh, to a call. And then it takes staff about another month in order to do uh, an uh, appropriate review process. So that's just about two months in order to do the, the response and review. Okay, and then you would envision that the pilot would be delivered or we would start engaging youth probably next spring? Yes. Next spring's when we'd be engaging youth, okay. And um, and then in terms of funding, so the grant would be for planning, delivery, and evaluation of the pilot by the s successful proponent over a two-year period? Yes, that is correct. Okay, all right. Okay, thank you very much. Those are my questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Ainsley. All right, uh, taking the matter into committee, any questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, speakers. Councillor Ainsley, wish to speak? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want, I'm just here to, to support this pilot as a city councillor in Scarborough. Um, this is going to be a pilot project that covers all of Scarborough. Um, and just as an example, the, the deputy from Big Brothers Big Sisters talks about uh, the need in Scarborough that there's, you know, this is a replicable pilot project that we're looking at, and right now they've estimated there's 42,000 children between the ages of 7 and 11 in, in Toronto that could um, take advantage or be part of this program. Uh, they have a long waiting list in the, in the former city of Scarborough where this pilot's gonna be. And I think as we're looking at mentoring youth between the ages of seven and 11, this is, um, there's definitely a need within the city of Toronto. Um, I wanna thank staff for all the work that they've done on this to date. I think it's a very exciting opportunity and uh, I hope that the committee will be fully supportive of it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Inzi, uh, anyone else to speak? <coughs> Seeing none, members of the committee, we have the item in front of us. What say you? All those in favor? Adopting the item? Opposed? That's carried, thank you. All right, so moving right along, we are now moving to uh, EC 10.5, Regent Park Swim Pilot and Engagement uh, Efforts. Um, pardon me? Uh, oh, that's right, yeah, sorry. I, I missed that for some strange reason. Yes, we had actually, I, I did hold four, but I'm gonna hold that down for a moment just with respect to members. I just have a few small questions, but I'd like to get on really to the, um, the speakers because I'm holding four. There are no speakers on four, right? So let's get to the speakers and let's get to the presenters. So just ask the very, we'll deal with four after this particular item. All those in favor, oppose, that's carried. All right, so members, just before we um, get speakers, I'd like to ask Mr. Dayton to uh, just to give us a five minute uh, presentation on this update so that we understand the issue clearly. Uh, Mr. Dayton, can you come forward please? Let me know when you're ready. 
Thank you. Good Mayor. morning, everyone, through the chair. Um, pleased to uh, be here to speak on the uh, Regent Park uh, Access uh, Program, the pilot aquatic program that was started in the Regent Park community. And just in terms of some initial background, um, in 2019, <coughs> Parks Forestry and Recreation obtained funding, uh, which was to operate the um, pilot swim program and really co-design that program with um, the Regent Park Access to Recreation Working Group. Um, and staff engaged immediately on really trying to understand how to better uh, engage local uh, children and youth in building their swim competencies in uh, the community. Um, we were also directed to engage with the local community on a couple of other issues related to um, recreation programming in the community, primarily as we move forward with the replacement of our registration facility booking software and just generally ways to continue to engage local residents in community-based recreation. So this co-design process uh, began and in the spring of 2019, uh, we began a local reference group with the Access to Recreation Working Group to really understand how best to engage local residents from the two schools being Nelson Mandela and Lord Dufferin Public School. And I'm pleased to report that we were able to launch this program in the summer of 2019. And the program really has three primary goals over its uh, pilot period. The first is that we started a summer aquatic camp and we had 120 students enrolled in the program throughout July and August. Those students were uh, taught some basic swim competencies, um, which we hoped would uh, allow them to advance through our aquatic level system. The second uh, component started in the fall in September, uh, where 270 students uh, would participate as part of their school curriculum. So the students were referred and enrolled through the school program with the local principals and, and um, teacher support um, to go to the Pam McConnell Aquatic Center and again build their swim competencies during the school day. That program started on September 9th and will continue in, through till June of 2020. And the third component uh, we have yet to launch, um, but that is including an aqua after school aquatic club and a leadership program. So once the students sort of has sustained participation and build up their competencies, the idea would be that they enter into our leadership programs, which we hope will help with future employment opportunities within our aquatic programming. So the preliminary results uh, are as follows. Pleased to report that 47% of the participants to date are brand new to swimming programs and indicate that they were able to access uh, swimming programs for the first time as a result of this pilot. 72% of the participants have completed and achieved their learning objectives of the swim levels that they enrolled in, and 100% of the participants surveyed report significant improvement in their swimming skills and competencies. So those are very positive and promising results, um, and we'll continue to work with those uh, students and the reference group to ensure that the program is meeting its intended goals as we conclude the pilot and determine how we would uh, sustain the program moving forward. We've also undertaken significant work with the Access to Recreation Working Group on other uh, barriers to technology and how we design the new registration system. Um, and they've been providing us some very important and useful feedback that we will incorporate into the specifications of that system and of some of the business requirements and policies that we have with respect to registration, preparing people for those registration dates and ensuring that uh, we're considering the needs of the local community and how that, that system launches. And that concludes uh, my presentation. Happy to take questions. Thank you very much. We'll have questions after the uh, uh, presenters, so the speakers, okay? Thank you very much for the update, Mr. Dean. Okay, moving right along, members. Um, our first uh, speaker on this item is uh, Marianne Scott, who's access to recreation. Ms. Scott? Is Marianne Scott? Sir, um, is Ms. Scott here? Is she speaking? Yes. Then please, okay, would you come forward, please? It's your time. Good morning and welcome to the committee. You have been here before. Good to see you again. Thank you. Let me know when you're ready. I'll start your time. Thank you. My name is Marianne Scott, and I'm a member of Access to Recreation. 
and co-chair of the pilot program, Cynthia, the pilot reference group. The pilot project is very vital to our community, especially now in the midst of gentrification, where we are seeing our children being left behind and not being able to access lessons at the pool that was built for the community. This pilot project, which allows children from Nelson Mandela and Lord Dufferin to have swimming lessons, is for the first time um, to have, uh, to, sorry, to have instructional swimming lessons for the first time is very important to us as a community and to the, and to the parents. To have children approach me in the community and thank me for giving me the opportunity, not that it was just me alone, to learn to swim is heartwarming and priceless. The continuation of this program is viable and important to the children of Regent Park, sorry, to the children of Regent Park. for this has opened doors, uh, this will open doors for them and give them a life skill and hopefully an opportunity for employment. I would also like to talk about this pilot project from an equity lens. There are a lot of people, me being one of them, who does not have the means to have high-speed internet for access to or access to multiple devices to register my children on registration day, and because of this, would not necessarily have a chance to access lessons. But because I line up the night before, a lot of, this allots my children a higher chance of getting a spot for lessons. This is dangerous for me and unacceptable. But I also realize that when and if I engage my children in programming from a young age, this nurtures and fosters a level of engagement that is positive, rewarding, and safe. Although my children are engaged and entering the levels to become lifeguards, they are still at risk. And this is scary for me as a parent. My children do not, did not get in the past cycle for um, swim lessons because I was not able to, I was not able to get them into the swim lessons this past session. The Regent Park Pilot Project is very vital to our community and we're, hope, we're glad that it's, it will move forward and allow our children to have a chance and opportunity to learn to swim. And um, while we are pleased and satisfied with the pilot project and that it exists, we have a lot more work to, to make sure that children in Regent Park have an equitable access to programs. And we are open to continuing the dialogue with PFNR and with Councillor Wong Tam to ensure that this happens. We also, I'm sure everyone is aware that there's been a rise of gun violence across the city, and unfortunately, we have seen that in our own community. And if we look at the inception of the pool in Regent Park and think about, um, and just think if children had the opportunity from day one to access the pool and the swimming lessons, we, I, I, just, I just can imagine how many children today would have been lifeguards. The pool has been open for, I think, seven years. And um, I just, this is something I think about of where our children would have been today had they had proper access to these, to this pool. With the pilot project, it's a banded solution. And, you know, I want to thank council for allowing this, um, this to happen, uh, to give us our children's opportunity. But we do have a lot more work to be done. And we, as access to recreation, um, is willing and uh, will continue to work for with council and with the city to ensure that this pilot project becomes permanent. 
Okay, thank, thank, you. thank you very much, ma'am. Just uh, one moment, please. There, there may be questions of you and so on. So visiting Councilor, Councilor Wintertown. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, and to our deputant, um, with respect to the, uh, the after school aquatic club in particular, um, during those critical hours when, uh, when the children are released from the, when they are, they're, they're coming out of school, um, if they're not in this particular aquatic uh, swim program, where may they be? Are there oh. any other recreational um, opportunities that these 200 kids could be in, in the region community? Yeah, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a tough question. That's, that's a hard answer. Um, sorry, hard question. We know that um, things happen and not nice things happen. And unfortunately, um, when children aren't engaged in programs and don't have the access to, to, to safe places, um, you know, bad things can happen. And, uh, you know, that was a issue um, when we lost Mackay last year. The recreation center was actually closed um, due to the fire. And, um, you know, a lot of us parents always think that had that rec center been open, you know, those boys would have been in the rec center. So it's very um, imperative and important that these children have access to these facilities, uh, the rec center and the pool, and to, to programming. And just to clarify, when you say that the, uh, the, the rec center, the, the, this is the Regent Park Community yes. Center, that was temporarily closed because it was uh, used as shelter spaces yes. for the residents who were displaced from 650 Parliament. Is yes. that correct? Yes. Yes. And and so you're saying that if the if the if the kids in Regent Park had access continued access to those recreation spaces, um, and the same that would go with the aquatic program after school, uh, they may be in safer spaces, program spaces with supervised uh, adult uh, supervision, and they and uh, and that Mackay Jackson in particular, the young. Yes. year old boy that was lost in region, he may not have been lost. Right. He would have been exactly where he was supposed to be on the basketball court with his friends. In the rec center, yes. And, and for the 200 young kids from Lord Dufferin and Nelson Mandela uh, who may not have um, any other options besides right now the pilot program through the aquatic uh, swim club, uh, you're, you're suggesting that perhaps um, it, they would also perhaps fall into at-risk behavior or an at-risk environment if they were not in those supervised uh, program spaces? Definitely. As much, I mean, even me as a parent um, who was very involved with my children, my children are still at risk. Regardless of, you know, what, you know, what I do with my children, the, pot, the, the opportunity is there, you know, for, for them to be exposed to, you know, to guns, gangs, and drugs. And with these programs, you know, I mean, with these programs, the the opportunity for them to do something positive, and to and to learn and to experience, is very important. And final question: Would you say that the um, that the Regent Park uh, uh, swim pilot program, uh, would you say that it's been life transforming for 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 the kids who are actually learning to swim for the very first time? Definitely. And when I hear the parents approach me and the children approach me in the community and hug me and, and thank me, not that it was just me that you know made this happen, um, but it, it makes me feel like it was just me <laughs> the way they just they embrace you. It's just an amazing feeling to see the smiles on their faces and to have them say. Um, you know, because some of these children have never ever, you know, put their face in the water, and they've never even been inside the Regent Park Aquatics Center. They've never taken lessons in there. They've never had instructional swim. And to, to hear the stories and see the smiles on their faces is, is definitely priceless. Great, thank you very much. And I just, so I just want to add that um, just the importance of engaging our children at a young age um, I have a, a daughter who is uh, 23 years old. She is actually in Dubai right now, um, and she plays rugby for Team Canada, and she won a bronze medal in Rio as the first women's rugby team. And one of her, fir her first exposure to Parks and Recs was in Regent Park in the old Smelly Center. <laughs> And, um, and because of that exposure that she's gotten, she's able to represent Canada and also be an Olympian and be a role model to the children in Regent Park and across the city of Toronto. Thank you. Congratulations.
All right, our uh, next um, speaker is Ishmael Araf, uh, Access to uh, Recreation. Ishmael, again, is no stranger to this committee, have been here before, and welcome. Good morning. Good morning. I'm hoping this comes across uh, it's something new. Um, Can you turn it the other way? This way? Yeah. Uh, the, the other, other way. <laughs> the right side up. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. Okay. Let me just start your time over again because yeah. we can start. Okay, go uh, the ahead, reason please. I can't see is because I'm not wearing my glasses. <laughs> okay. Uh, they're, they're broken, uh, what do you call it, I ever slept uh, on them while reading. Uh, I hate uh, when that happens. Yeah, so it's very hard to see your faces right now, but uh, we're all I'll, smiling. Yeah, which is a good thing. <laughs> uh, I wanted to uh, start by uh, thanking this committee uh, for the work uh, that we've been doing together over the last uh, few years. Uh, I remember we started here in this committee with uh, a very quick surprise uh, uh, turnaround. We've never been part of the city uh, process. And uh, it was our first time engaging the city at all. And uh, luckily we had uh, an out outstanding city councilor who uh, uh, took our complaints and our uh, uh, local uh, uh, frustrations and made, uh, made it possible to create a, a pathway to a solution. So I want to thank uh, Councilor Wang Tam for, the, for those efforts, and I want to thank this committee uh, for the response that they took for the first time when they saw us and said uh, uh, that some items are easily uh, manageable, so we will send that to the budget committee. Some items require a longer process of dialogue, so we will have you sit with the uh, Parks and Rec and other items um, will require further conversation. Uh, it, it was a, uh, what do you call, a good uh, response to uh, a community complaint. And from that conversation, we've managed to pull off something remarkable. Uh, if you look at uh, some of the results from the pilot, uh, we have uh, 120 kids uh, from uh, Nelson Mandela and Lord Dufferin for the first time uh, learning how to swim. Uh, 200 of them uh, for the first time engaging part of their school year uh, on a swim pilot where 47% of them have never been part of, have never touched water, right? So the, the results are very remarkable. And I think the reason why they're remarkable is because of this co-design and co-development uh, piece. Um, this is uh, a slide, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a theory of change from the Center of Connected Community. And their approach is called the connected community approach. The idea is to bring everybody to the table, uh, those with uh, policy, those with uh, power, those resident leaders, everybody who has a stake in an issue, to bring them all together in a table and to sort of uh, dialogue and problem solve a given solution at a neighborhood level. And to me, th this approach is quite inspiring because the city of Toronto has taken on that approach. Uh, in your Toronto Strong Neighborhood Strategy, you have uh, uh, three uh, set of directions, which is activating people, activating resources, and activating neighborhood-friendly policies. I think through uh, our work together, we're we're managing to pull the uh, uh, to pull to pu to put the ball along. And I'm, I'm quite happy that we've uh, worked together on this pilot. Parents for the first time in Regent Park are, ex are excited about uh, 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 these opportunities. Uh, I also wanted to tackle some things on the report. Uh, for instance, the consultation on the new registra registration uh, system. Uh, we have met with uh, uh, that, that team that, was, that, that are developing the new registration system. Uh, we've given them our feedback, and I'm hoping that we can continue to engage with them as they develop and implement the new system. It's not enough to engage the community at the front end and take in their input, but then go away for about seven, seven months, one year, and then come back with something. I, I think the model here is we should take this model, which is uh, a continuous engagement where we are involved at the, at the design level, at the development, and also at the implementation. So I would like to uh, ask this committee to uh, uh, continue the spirit of uh, further engagement on that effort. Uh, so I'm just going to use my broken glasses to see if I'm on time. Uh, You're good, uh, sir. Uh, so 
so it's been a remarkable year. Uh, what, what, what are some next steps? I think uh, if, if I looked at the report, uh, the first part of the report talks about the service delivery overall of the space. And it's remarkable how well the space is used, the aquatic center is used. Uh, thousands of spaces, thousands of programming. Um, I'm hoping that in the next uh, future sittings with Parks and Rec, that we can co-design and co-develop further programs that are preventions and interventions that are locally responsive. Uh, this is a pilot. I'm hoping that the, the city council and this committee would recognize its value and continuance, but also how do we get f more programming that is co-developed, co-designed, and that we can use as uh, prevention strategies at, at the ground, because uh, this is where it matters. We want to connect the services, the high quality services you offer Your to point. the communities that are in need. You're and the only minutes, way sir. forward is co-development. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. All right, so a visiting um, members of committee, uh, question, Councilor Wong Tan. Uh, yes, Please. thank you very much. And I just want to ask a, a question regarding the registration and, and uh, yeah. the registration process. I think we've, you've, you said that you've, we've seen some success because the community and the, and the staff came together to co-design the pilot project. Um, is, uh, is, uh, is it your assumption or your understanding that the staff will work with the community to then co-design the new registration program for recreation services across the city? Uh, I, I think uh, uh, from what I've seen from the, the model that they're using, uh, 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 from my understanding, the initial stages was well done. There was a citywide consultations that happened, surveys were done online, and also specific uh, consultations were done with specific communities. So the initial consultation process was uh, well done. And we even got a, a, a report to our, our, our committee on what those consultations were. I think the next steps are, uh, while the, 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 the team that's designing this to, to take those feedback in to offer, to see where the new systems can be made improved on, but also to come back to the community uh, uh, on feedbacking what they've delivered. The, we, we, we've spoke, uh, they've heard, now they'll do some work. We want them to come back to us and say, hey, uh, we've listened to you, this is the implications from our listening. And when we see if, uh, uh, the implications, then we can say, you've, you've truly listened because we've, w this is the things we've said, and this is how the new system will help us. If that uh, continuous engagement doesn't happen, and uh, what do you call it, uh, they go away, and then we, we never see what the result of our consultation was, that would be problematic. I'm hoping through this committee that further engagement uh, uh, at the development stage and also at the implementation stage that we're also involved in those conversations. And would you say that, uh, that when the new registration program and software rolls out, um, success for this community um, would, could be defined by just having equitable access to recreation services uh, and facilities in their own community? Yes, and I, and I, I think I, I looked at uh, uh, what do you call uh, the RFP that was sent for the new system. When, when, the, when the city was asking what our expectations are of this new system, uh, it had a, a, an equity impact statement. Uh, I, I think all of the city reports nowadays have an equity impact. And the equity impact is, was that the rationale for getting this new system was that uh, low-income communities, communities that are marginalized, are further helped with this new technology. So if the RFP says this is why the system was created, uh, to stay true to that statement, it needs to be co-developed uh, with uh, communities that are impacted. So uh, we are hoping, like the first question I have after the, uh, this whole process is to say uh, what actual uh, changes is made to the system based on our feedback. If there is, if the new system doesn't help us in any way, I think that's a frustration, but also that's uh, uh, the rationale for getting a new system is mute. So that's why I think further engagement and collaboration between the team that's building this with uh, communities that are impacted, uh, not to be at the design stage, but also at the development and implementation, because that's the only way we can stay true to what we started out with. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councillor. Uh, any further uh, questions of uh, the presenter? Okay, seeing none, thank you, sir. Thank you. Our next um, speaker is uh, Joel Clausen. Young Street Mission. You have five minutes, sir. Okay. Morning. Good morning. Good morning, councillors. Uh, my name is Joel Clausen 
I'm a community capacity builder at Young Street Mission in Regent Park. Uh, and I play a support role with the Access to Recreation group. Uh, so I work in the Community Development Department, and our goal is to build strong resident groups that can make change in their communities, and Access to Recreation is a shining example of what can be achieved through this approach. Our mandate at Young Street Mission is to end chronic poverty in Toronto in one generation. Um, we know we can't do that alone, um, but we believe strongly that we can achieve it uh, by partnering at all, at all levels, in neighbourhoods, as we're doing with access to recreation, across the city and with the municipal government. You're hearing today uh, from community members and group members who have identified a deeply felt need in their lives and their community and who have crafted a deft strategy to begin to address it. The Regent Park Swim Pilot is a model of city staff working together with community members over time to address a felt need in multiple ways. It's the first time, as, as Ismail was mentioning, it's the first time that we've done this kind of partnering with the city. And we do feel that we've achieved a lot. Okay. We've gathered a lot of learnings uh, to make this uh, partnership even stronger going forward, we hope. Um, and we understand there's going to be an amendment uh, to uh, the motion today to, uh, to examine the feasibility of making the swim pilot permanent. Uh, so we would uh, strongly support that uh, amendment. And our goal, I mean, it, it, we ha we're hearing lots of great stuff from the community about uh, where things are going. So wouldn't it be great to be able to continue that in a permanent way and that there's no gap for the, the, neighbor, the children in the neighborhood in terms of accessing uh, this, this, uh, par this program, uh, this, uh, in, in this partnership between the TDSB schools and uh, Parks, Forestry and Rec. Ultimately, we want to make sure that kids across the neighborhood, all kids across the neighborhood can get access to recreation um, that they need. Um, and we've heard uh, that this is a need that is felt in other parts of the city. Uh, we believe it could be uh, what's happening in Regent Park could be a model uh, for what could happen elsewhere, especially in other revitalizations. Um, and so we think it'd be wise for council to look for ways that you can partner with uh, local initiatives in other parts of the city in order to also respond to similar locally felt needs. Um, and just one additional piece in terms of how uh, this work is actually uh, moving forward City Council's agenda. Um, Young Street Mission has aligned our community uh, development work with the goals and structure of the Region Park Social Development Plan. The overarching principle uh, and goal of that plan is to build social cohesion during uh, the re revitalization. And so there's many ways that the Access to Recreation Group contributes to that goal, uh, starting with the membership. It reflects much of the diversity of Regent Park, and importantly, community members, both from market rent housing and from Toronto community housing, make up the group. Uh, so supporting the group's work uh, moves not only towards City Council's goal of better equitable access to recreation, but also to its goal of building social cohesion. Uh, especially in uh, neighborhoods going, undergoing revitalization. So it's imperative that you listen carefully to the voices of residents. It's imperative that you look hard and deep at how you're responding to the needs of the most vulnerable in the community and that you take effective action to improve your practices. Thank you very much for your presentation, sir. Questions? Visiting member, seeing none. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, we have uh, a number of additions to the list. Very pleased to welcome Deanna Alexander to the uh, to the podium. Miss Alexander, hi. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm very well. You having a good day so far? Yeah. This is your first time speaking to us. Yes. So can I just tell you a secret? Just present and just be confident. Look, you have some partners coming. I think you have some colleagues coming up to 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 be with you. Uh, we we're very delighted that you've added your name to the list, and so on. I know my staff came up to speak to you, uh, but I really wanted to hear from you because this is all about you guys, right? So welcome. You have five minutes to speak. There's a clock on the side, and just take your time. Everybody will be listening to you. You've got the room to yourself, right? It's your stage. There might be questions of you at the end, and just take your time in terms of responding to the questions 
and just speak into the mic. That's great, okay? okay? So thank you very much. And one day you may be in this chair, so it's just as practice, all right? Thank you. You may begin. My name is Jayana. I'm a student of Lord Dufferin Public School. I had the opportunity to go swimming at the community pool with my class in November. It was good. We had fun, but still learned how to swim. I feel knowing how to swim is, an imp is important because it's a life skill and could save my life if I ever drown. I would, I would like to continue to swim next year with my class. Okay, is that it? Yeah. Fantastic, that's a really important message to us. Um, so I'm going to ask now if any members of council have questions for you. I'm gonna start with a visiting member of council first. She's not a member of the committee, but she's part of council and welcome to the committee. She's your local councillor in your area and that's Councillor Christian Wong Tam, okay? So I'm gonna ask her if she has questions of you. Councillor Wong Tam? Uh, yes, I do, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And, uh, and thank you for your deputation so far. Uh, I wanted to just ask further, if you were not in the after school uh, pilot swim program, where might you be? Are there other activities that you could be a part of? Like after school? Mm -hmm. What would you normally be doing after school if you weren't at the swim program? I go to MSLE. Can, <laughs> Can you repeat the question, please? Uh, if, you're, if you were not in the uh, uh, swim program after school, where else might you have been? Or where, where would you be going after school? The launch pad? Okay, so and the MLE's, MLE's, MLSE launch pad is, a, is another recreational space, but not necessarily run by the City of Toronto. Yes. Right? So it's, it's on Jarvis, which is, which is a bit further away from region. And would you be walking there? Yeah, it's a walking distance, so yeah, I walk there. Okay, but, but the MLE, MLSE launch pad is where you would go if you weren't at the Regent Park Aquatic Center. Yes. So, but at, at the, what, but the, but where you really want to be is always in, in some form of recreation space. Yes. Yeah, after school, that's what you want to do. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Councilor Wong Tam. Okay, any more questions uh, for Deanna? Okay, I have one for you. Okay. So when you have a problem, a challenge, what's the best way to solve it? Is it to solve it by yourself or try to get others to have input and participate as we're trying to do with the community. Is that a good way, you think? Yes. Yes, so that's the perfect way. And as a community, you, real, you think it's really important to have everybody's voice to address a concern? Yes. And that's part of what you're doing here today? Yes. And I wanna thank you so much for being here to contribute to this discussion because your objective, which is to achieve greater opportunity and benefits to the community, is part of that process, right? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, and so I'm going to move to the next speaker. Um, the next person I have is, uh, I believe it's Chloe Geechee. Ah, Chloe. Hi, Chloe. Good morning. How are you? Um, is this? And are you Marshita? Is Marshita is here as well? Are you mom? Come on up. Are you coming to speak? Come on up and hang out with them at the podium, of course. Uh, so good morning, Chloe, and welcome to this morning's meeting. I'm very honored that you're here with us. May I ask, if you don't mind, how old are you? Um, we're eight years old. Oh, fantastic. I just wanted to make sure the reference, so the youngest members of the community are speaking to us this morning. So we just wanted to, to set the stage for that, all right? Are you both going to speak? Okay, that's fantastic. So I'm gonna give you guys each five minutes if you want it that much. So that combination will be 10 minutes. I don't know if you need that much time, but I just wanna reference that. So welcome to committee. And this is your first time speaking to us? Yes. It's an honor to have you. So I just wanna tell you the time is on the left-hand side. And so as you speak, keep looking at the time sometimes just to make sure that you're within the five minutes, okay? And uh, there might be members of the committee and uh, the visiting member might ask you questions, okay? Are you ready? Okay, you may begin. Hi, my name is Chloe. I attended Nelson Mandela Pike Public School. I'm eight years old. The swimming program is helping me and my friends because if one of us fell off a boat, we will know what to do. 
Before the swimming program, me and my friends were unable to go because it was always full. Let's continue the program for other kids who don't know how to swim. Let's go swimming. Let's go. My name. My name is Abyssinia Scott. I'm homeschooled, so I, I do swimming, but I don't go to school in the swimming programs. Um, my mom stays up all night to get me in the programs at Regent Park, and it's just nice to be in the programs. Okay. Thank you both very much. So let me just ask now, and we'll just do combine. If members of council have questions for you both, you can answer and interject in. Councilor Wong Tam, question? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, when you say that your mom stays up all night to get you into the swim program, is she at home on the computer trying to register you for the swim program? No, or she, she goes outside, she stays up all night. So your mom is lined outside the community center? Yes. Waiting for the community center to open in the morning so that she can be in the front of the line to get you uh, registered for the programs, is that correct? Yes. And so do you sometimes go out with her and stay overnight to register for those programs? No. So so somebody else is taking care of you at home while your mom is staying out overnight? Yes. And and sometimes is, is it cold? And do you miss your mom when your mom is outdoors waiting to register f you for the programs? Yeah. You would rather her She's be home? a really long time. She's gone for a long time. You, you would rather her be home with you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you both, both very much for speaking to us today. Thank you. Thank you. And now I have, and I'm just gonna, uh, Murshida uh, Sam, Samin, Samen, Samin? Sam Samin? Yes. Okay, good morning, Murshida. Thank you for coming. Um, you know the drill, I think, here, so you've been here before. I uh, see so you'll have five minutes to speak, and then members may have questions of you, okay? Thank you so much for being here. Pleasure. You may want to move. Sure. It's whichever one you like. Sorry, bear with me. This is the first time I'm talking in public like this. Um, my name is Murshida Samson Moin, and I'm a mother of five children. Um, my second one, I just want to acknowledge that when I, when I drive my kids to school and come, I see these great four students going to the swimming program, how exciting they are, and then they're happy, and then they're talking so much stuff about the, you know, how they go, while they're going, you know. I wish I took a video and show it to you guys. But my second son is participating in that swimming program in the summer, and I was so happy that he had something to learn in the summer instead of staying with me, with me in the house. Um, I just hope I had that chance with my first son as well, which I couldn't give him a proper lessons because I couldn't, I could never get into the program or register through the online system or even being in the line. And every time I go there, the system is already full. So um, it's, it's really made me upset and then I had to give him extra lesson by, I have to take my time to go, go with him. As an adult, I have to be there with him anyway. Um, I just hope you guys continue this program so the rest of my kids can uh, get use of it as well as other community members as well. And kids are really excited, you know, using that program, going in a different trips and everything. And my son comes and always talk about it and then the skill that he learned. And when I take him to the beach and I can see instead of he's just playing ball in the water, he's actually swimming. So that makes me, in a different level, I was like, I'm like so happy and I'm, I'm kind of confident to take them outside in the water too and different areas of the water. So as I said, thank you for listening. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation, ma'am. Just uh, just hold for a moment, see if there's, there's any, whether or not there's any questions. Councilor Wong Tan, question? No questions, just thank you for coming out today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other members with committee questions? Okay, seeing none. Okay, um, members, I've exhausted the uh, speakers list and I would like to now uh, open the floor for questions of staff. Should members have questions of staff? Visiting uh, Councillor Councilor Wong Tam. Uh, yes, thank you. I'll, I'll try to keep it short. I recognize you have a very long agenda. Um, yes. Just a question to staff with respect to the uh, the early assessment of the program. The program's now been up and running for just under, uh, I, I would say, um, f five months. Is that correct? Um, 
what would be your uh, what would be your your feedback to to us so far? Would you say that it's been a, a an early success? All indications. Through the chair, yes, I would say that all indications are quite positive, and it's been a successful program to date. And uh, and given the fact that this is a unique um, uh, tailored program for Regent, uh, is it? Is it uh, the belief that PFR, that this could be a, a program that could be exported to other communities, uh, recognizing that there are school children, uh, school age children that could also uh, use additional opportunities to swim in other neighborhoods and other communities? So uh, through the chair, and um, I also just want to acknowledge the deputants that were here that did a great job, and also want to acknowledge uh, Howie and Aidan Srasbas and Sue Barlman who are here who have been very involved in developing the program because I think they've done a great job. Uh, I can say just to the deputants and to the question uh, that we've learned a lot about community engagement and co-designing programs through the development of this program and we think it's a great success and we do think it's something we should look at in other areas of the city uh, to see if we can gain the same understanding of what people's needs are but also the same program responses to what people feel is most important. So yes, to your question, I think it does have the capacity uh, to, to expand into other areas of the city. We just need to be able to evaluate what some of those options are. Right. And then finally, um, with respect to participation and partnership with the TDSB, uh, they have been, I understand, fully on board uh, with uh, uh, making sure that communication and supervision is very clearly uh, uh, articulated but also consistently followed through as the kids move from the school facility to the rec facility. Is that correct? Through the chair, that's correct. And I should also uh, commend uh, the, the school principal at, uh, at, the, at both of those schools for the partnership because it's a great example of how uh, the city and PFNR are working in collaboration with the TDSB can really advance some joint, uh, you know, benefits to the community. So it's been a great relationship. Okay, thank you. Uh, actually, maybe one, one final question I should ask. With respect to the registration reforms, and, the, and I know that there, that, that there is a ongoing development on, on improving and enhancing the registration program for rec services, uh, can you give this committee a, an indication of when uh, there might be a, a testing program, uh, an opportunity for the community to loop back and give you through, feedback through the, before it becomes permanent? To the chair, very timely question as we were just meeting about that yesterday. Uh, I can't give you a specific date, but I, I can say that the testing will involve a, a pre-testing of the program before it runs out publicly, and we will be engaging members of the public in that test environment, and I think this group is certainly on our list of members to continue to engage in that process as it evolves. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councillor. All right, members are bringing the matter into committee. Are there any questions for uh, the uh, staff. Let's say you members. Okay, seeing none. Um, just a question for me for staff. Um, you're continuing the uh, discussion, collaboration, and conversation with the community at large, and uh, that process, that work started. You've indicated it's going well, um, and we're asking you to report back. There's a motion coming that will ask you to report back to do a review. Um, and the motion is such that it would also say that um, subject to your recommendations, what comes back, then we take the, the matter into the budget community. That is, would be the best approach in terms of dealing with it. Would it not be correct? Would that be correct? I, I would agree that that would be a good approach, yes. And we're happy to report back on the results. Right, because if we were to do it sort of a two-step process and simply ask that it go into the budgetary process, let's say for 2021, it would be obviously the cart before the horse and that, you know, a cart's never going to pull the horse. Is that correct? I mean, the learnings and the report back could inform right. what the budget request is to more round out the program based on those results. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, yes, thank you very much. I want to thank the deputants for taking the time from their days, and I recognize that some of the kids are probably not in school and here speaking to us. I want to say thank you for that, uh, for your conversation and also feedback uh, as well. Um, and I also want to thank this committee. Um, just as Ismail had noted, it's actually this particular committee that was um, the first to respond from a city structure uh, and institutional perspective to the demands and, and, the, and the concerns of the local um, uh, the local uh, members, and I do think that uh, 
that although we were unclear on where we were going, uh, what I really do appreciate was the fact that the committee was willing to actually uh, open the door, direct staff to actually explore what this program can look like. And, uh, and the end result so far, or in the interim result, I can think we can say is some very um, good early responses and the evaluation to come, uh, I think, is absolutely uh, critical. Um, I want to just note that um, it's, uh, it's not just about the kids of Regent. This is about all the children in every single community and neighborhood across the city that is not gaining access to recreation and aquatic services and programs. And just as much as we've seen es escalation of violence and gun violence in the community, uh, it is never lost on this particular community, and I'm sure other communities may feel the same, is that if there was adequate programming for young kids, especially the after school um, time, uh, that oftentimes uh, there, there may have been a way to divert them away from the at-risk behavior and at-risk uh, uh, environments. Um, and I want to just recognize that this is not just about a swim program, but it's about making sure that everyone has access. And I know that the staff are working really hard at uh, re-evaluating and trying to uh, determine what that new registration program will look like. I recognize that there are probably some things that the community is raising that the staff uh, perhaps not are, are not quite uh, ready per, uh, at this point in time to address. But overall, I believe that there are um, extraordinary individuals who are very innovative, very creative, that are getting to that outcome. So we will look forward to seeing the citywide registration program for recreation be reformed and enhanced. So mothers like Sugar Scott will not have to be lined outdoors with Mesida uh, overnight to get their children into these critical uh, recreation programs, because that's really not um, that's not the way for us as a world-class city to actually design programs and to deliver them to our communities. Um, but at, I also want to just highlight, uh, there's two individuals who are not in the room, uh, but they're also critical in bringing this program forward. When we were um, debating the, the 2019 budget, and that of course is Mayor Tory and Budget Chief uh, Crawford. Um, they heard, uh, in particular Mayor Tory, he, he heard uh, Sugar, um, Miss, Miss Scott's uh, personal story about her daughter who was an Olympian. Uh, I think he was quite moved to know that you know she got her first start in, in, in access to recreation services right here in the city of Toronto through publicly, publicly funded, uh, publicly accessible programs programs, and, uh, and I want to thank the mayor who's not here and, and the budget chief for actually supporting the pilot project uh, because there's lots of things that we can say no to and for sure uh, on the floor of the budget uh, debate, lots of things get left behind, uh, but in this case they said yes and it opened the door to something I believe that is going to be truly transformative, not just for region, but perhaps for other neighborhoods in the city of Toronto. We look forward to doing that. Um, there is a motion that uh, I have uh, prepared and I know that uh, Councillor Thompson has provided good feedback as well as um, our DCM and, uh, and I think Councillor Cressy will be moving it. Uh, I wholeheartedly support a, a proper evaluation coming back to this committee and hopefully by way of early indications of, of the successes that we're seeing, uh, hopefully that will be sustained uh, through the two-year program and at that point in time uh, there will uh, hopefully, uh, I anticipate a recommendation to make this program uh, permanent and let's try to then export it to every neighbourhood where we can and then to scale it up across the city. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councillor. Okay, uh, bring the matter into committee uh, to speak. Councillor Cressy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I, I have um, a motion, if it can be placed on the screen, uh, on behalf of Councillor Wong Tam. Let me begin, first of all, by thanking the speakers and the members of the community who came out, in particular, uh, the kids who, I, I tell you, one day, you guys one day are gonna be my boss. I have no doubt about it. So thank you to you for your leadership in the community, to Councillor Wong Tam for her relentless leadership and commitment to this, and to Chair Thompson, who has been steadfast in his support as well for this neighborhood. Um, I just want to briefly build on Councillor Wong Tam's comments with respect to revitalizations, of which I have had the privilege of, of being part of two Toronto Community Housing revitalizations in my wards in Alexandra Park and 250 Davenport. Fundamentally, revitalizations have two objectives, and they're both around people, not buildings, but people. The first is to provide greater opportunities for the people who live in the communities today, in Alexandra Park, in, Ale in uh, Regent Park, in Lawrence Heights, around 250 Davenport. Uh, it's to provide opportunities employment opportunities, educational opportunities, uh, access to services to improve the lives of those people. That's the first objective. 
And the second objective is to build mixed income communities, to correct the mistakes of the past so that we're building a complete city together. And so with revitalization comes social infrastructure. And we must ensure that we utilize that social infrastructure to accomplish both of those objectives. Supporting and building up the people who live in the communities today while also creating a mixed income community for tomorrow. And that's why this pilot is so critical because it leverages the social infrastructure for the future to build a mixed income community, but not at the expense of the community that exists today that the Revite is set out to serve and support. And so I want to, I want to, uh, I want to close with that comment and I want to commend uh, our staff, Howie Dayton and our general manager, Janie Romoff, for recognizing how we can develop a model that builds on both of those objectives. So kudos all around. Uh, and with that, I will conclude my remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Cressy. Anyone else to speak? Okay, seeing none, I'll just uh, speak for a moment. Um, I too want to thank the community, and uh, particularly I want to thank Deanna and uh, Chloe for uh, their presentation and all the other young people that came. I think it's very brave to stand here to talk to this room um, of folks in suit and ties and so on, and I think that they have done an amazing job, and I was very pleased to ask my staff to go over and ask the whether or not the kids could speak, and, and, and I'm really happy that we can hear from them because I think this is about them. This is about why we're doing this, and it's really super important for us, this body, to hear from the very people that we're trying to work with to ensure that the services that they want, and uh, Councillor Cressy mentioned about, you know, uh, the, the, the social inclusion, social component part on, in the infrastructure. But I want to say one word, six letters, one word, six letters, access. It's such a fundamentally important part of this discussion. So for too many people, they don't have access to many of the things that we just assume or take for granted in the city. And too many of them look like me. Too many of them look like the diversity that this city ref reflects. And so we are a city, a sanctuary city. We are a city that cares. We have a mayor that talks about leadership and talks about inclusion, lives it, breathes it, breathes it every single day. We want to demonstrate to the entire world all of us are in this together. And so the services that are needed in communities are brought forward through the community lens. It's really important that we understand it from their perspective, not from a perspective that's up here or that's not involved with the community. You know, one of my favorite, uh, you know, a, a hero, quite frankly, Bob Marley is a singer. Everybody knows Bob Marley throughout the world. One of the quotes that in, in his one of his song, he says, and it just he says this, he who feels it the most knows it the best, right? And so unless you're part of that change and bringing forward your ideas because you're feeling it, the lived experience, it's such an important thing for us to engage people to change their lives. We tend to bring a lot of folks into the mix. The knowledge that they may have from an academic level, that's great. However, the reality is that from a social feeling it and experiencing it and have a strong understanding, it's often lacking. And so this community has come forward and say, hey, we want to be part of this success. In my own community, we've taken a bit of a model of that, where we're leading the, the Glamorgan and Antrim area. Two weeks ago, we had a meeting with just the residents and other people to help them. We've said we're going to form a resident-led group that decide on what the goals, what the objectives are, what the challenges are, and they've provided us with those. Very informed because, again, they're experiencing, they're living those experiences that they want to change and transform. And oftentimes we take the approach uh, that we can bring ideas and we can implement and bring something and dropping it in, but that's not sufficient. And so I want to thank our amazing staff team, um, you know, Mr. Mr. Dayton and Ms. Romroff and, and their team that have worked and listened to the committee. And I want to thank this committee. We have heard, and, and there was a time when we kind of started 
maybe not so close, at least that it appeared that was a bit of friction, but it really wasn't. It was, but we wanted to get the elements right. And that's often about process and doing things the correct way. I'm a fundamental believer in doing things the right way for the right reason to get success. Oftentimes in the business of politics, we throw things out because it's easy for us as politicians, right? We've dealt with matters, a uh, matter we dealt with a couple of days ago with, you know, the decision of a counselor and so on, and it just sound great for their interests. But in the best interest of all, it was not the right thing to do, quite frankly. And so as we move forward in trying to help to solve some of the problems and using this community's um, you know, work as a model for the rest of the city, it's extremely important. One of the things that happened, because I was around here in the days when we decide on you know, revitalization of Regent Park, what I didn't know at the time when we made the decision, that a lot of the people who were in Regent Park at the time actually were displaced never really returned in the manner that we thought that they were going to be returned and the housing that we thought they were going to get. It's a little known, well, I guess it's a secret, City of Toronto, that they never went back and they never became part of that success. So we want this community to be part of that. So we want to be the success. And I think for those reasons, I'm supporting the motions in front of us. And for those reasons, I want to thank our staff again and thank everybody who has come in consistently to say, hey, we're not going away. We want you to listen to us. We want to be part of the solution of our success. And that's what I see when you come to talk to us. And the young people that spoke to us uh, this morning, again, I want to thank Gianna uh, uh, and uh, Chloe for being here. So thank you very much. And uh, the item is on the floor. Um, yes? Of course. Uh, Councillor Lai, please to speak. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I wasn't going to speak, but I think uh, you really have a very touching message that you just spoken, and it's all about access. And I really, really resonate in what you're saying. And I just wanted to have a final note. I just wanted to uh, commend uh, Councillor Wong Tam. And uh, for those of you who are here, who is her constituents, you're very lucky to have such a caring councillor. And I really wanted uh, just to uh, echo, and then for those uh, youngest uh, deputants that are here, I really encourage you to, uh, you did a very, very good job. I just wanted to encourage you to uh, to make sure that you uh, get involved in the community and then everything will be looked after. So I just wanted to uh, echo on, on that and just before we vote on it, and I will I would be supporting the motion. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. I echo the compliments to the councillor. She's worked diligently and hard to help our community. So the item is on uh, the screen. All those in favour? Opposed, that's carried. Item is amended. Um, All those in favor, opposed, that's carried. Thank you. And members, I, I just want to take a quick second and ask the young people who spoke and some parents just to come up. We have a couple of uh, some pins, uh, City of Toronto pins. I'd like to present that to them if I can just ask for just a bit of a, an interlude, if you will, of the committee. So just come on up, guys. And may I just ask to come and shake hands and just say hi? Christian, come on up with us. Just come on up here, guys. Come on up. Come on up, Mark. Yes, that's the youngest. You guys were the youngest deputy ever to this community. This is City of Toronto pin. It has um, the City Hall and it has Toronto. Is that okay? And we'll come around next. I'll give you one of these. Okay. May I shake your hands? Thank you very much. Thank you. And for you guys. Thank you. I, th I think we're going to come around and take a photo with you. May we come and one of you as well? Thank, thank you. you. I don't think you have one of these. Right. Can we just go around quickly and just take a quick photo? Sure. Okay, thank you.
Thank you very much. Um, we're now going to go back to um, EC 10.4. And um, uh, we have questions uh, of staff. Does anyone have any questions of staff? I, I do. <laughs> so, um, so questions of staff. Um, I, I just wanted to ask, with respect to this item, this 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 matter has been um, reviewed and studied by OIC since 2014. Uh, to the chair, that's correct. The research study began in 2014. Right, and so 2014. We are where we are today. What have we learned to date? Um, to date, through the uh, process of engaging families, we've learned a lot about their journey in um, accessing childcare, what some of those barriers are, and how our staff can support them as they are trying to enter into childcare and potentially return to the workforce. And we've learned those things, and so how are we implementing them as part of our process? Um, to the chair, uh, councillor, uh, we've implemented some changes in our intake process when we meet with families uh, once they've been deemed eligible for a child care fee subsidy. Really, it's more of a, um, a focus on service navigation to really support them through the process. The uh, research project is about 75% complete, so by the end of the project, we hope to have more learnings that we can apply. Okay, thank you. Um, so how has the fund, uh, the, the funding that we have implemented, how has that been spent in terms of, is there a breakdown and, and, and have we looked at that? Because you're not asking for more money at this particular point in time, you're asking to spend the allocation that was um, approved in 2014. So um, the in, we do receive invoices from OISE that provide a detailed breakdown of what the funding is used for, but a lot of that time is for their staff to reach out to families. Um, they're connecting with them at least uh, once a year to track their progress. Um, they're monitoring how those families are doing. So we do receive detailed information from them, and we'd be happy to share that with you if you'd like more information. I wonder if you could provide some information to members of the committee. I think it'd be helpful to actually have that information for us to uh, review. Uh, okay, those are all my questions. Um, are there any questions for uh, staff or many of the members? Okay, um, those are all the things. I don't need to speak to it. I think that the work that's being done other than is, is actually uh, is, is great work. We're being uh, informed in terms of how to respond and to uh, allocate ways and provide ways to um, to help in this uh, with respect to this really important issue. And I think obviously OISE is an organization; it's world renowned. I mean, it's outstanding. Our relationship with them is very impactful, and I think it's um, it's great work that's actually being done. But I just had to ask those questions to ensure that we uh, at least have an update and in some information. So um, the item is in front of us. Uh, it's basically um, move uh, to um, to receive the item. Is this what we do? Number four. Okay, sorry. So, okay. So the item's here, uh, folks. It's authorized council to, of course, to extend the, 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 um, the purchase order because that's really what you wanted to do in terms of the extension. So all those in favor? Opposed, that's carried. Thank you very much. That matter is dealt with. Um, okay. Mr. Chair, could I ask? Councillor Cressy. If it, if it is the will of yourself and committee, um, I know we have speakers on the next item. We have shelter staff here who have held, because I held item 10.10 .10, to prepare a small amendment. If it's the will of you and committee, um, I wonder if we can. Is it quick? Amendment. It's very quick. I won't okay. even speak to it. Okay, fair enough. Okay, so um, we're just varying the order of the agenda to deal with uh, EC 10.10. .10. Okay, all those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Councillor Cressy. Uh, thank you. And this floor. is a very, this is the item dealing with hotels and motels, and this is a very quick amendment I have if it can be placed for a report back on the viability of whether purchasing these properties would make more financial sense rather than endlessly paying to lease spaces in them. So it's not to do that, it's for a report back on it. Okay, you don't want me to give you an answer, right? <laughs> no, we discussed it, that's okay. <laughs> all right, they, all right, so that's fine. That's a report having staff. Uh, when do you want it back? Uh, at the request of staff, I didn't indicate a timeline because- even, Okay, that's fine. That's fine. So, uh, Councillor Cressy's uh, motion's on the table. 
just want to make sure everyone's had a chance to review it because it's just been brought forward. Okay. Um, all those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Item is amended. All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Thank you very much. We are now moving to item 10.8. Members, we have two items left. 10.8. And I haven't asked the staff, but I'm just wondering if you could do just a quick five-minute update or briefing uh, on uh, your report just before we have the speakers. Through the chair, My apologies. I, I had a, not asked I do you have a deck that, that I can pass over to put up on the screen if you like. Sure. Please, let's do that. I think this is an important matter that we need to have a strong understanding of. And my apologies to the staff. I had not uh, asked them in advance. I had meant to, but the morning has sort of slipped away from me. So my apologies. Uh, that's my fault. Deputy. <laughs> Vice Chair Grimes is saying, yes, your fault. <laughs> I know everything's my fault. <laughs> oh, my mic is on. In the interim, we have um, EC 10.21, which is an item, uh, Rivertown Social Development uh, Coordination. There's a motion, Madam Clerk? Uh, so it's a recommendation, it? recommendation here. Right. So there's a recommendation here. Uh, it's an uh, item from uh, Councillor Fletcher. Uh, we've had some conversation. It is, staff is fine with it. I'm fine with it. And I gather that members are fine with it as well. So I'm simply going to move the recommendation that's here. Uh, any questions on this? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed, that's carried. Thank you very much. We've now dealt with uh, EC 10.21, and we have uh, one item left, um, which is uh, EC 10.8, and staff is just setting up. And we have uh, approximately um, uh, 65 minutes. So, staff, I don't want you to take that, that you have that much time. <laughs> Thank you. Protocol is all in, in effect. I think everybody knows who you are, but maybe if you just as a quick review, just uh, introduce everyone at the table, please. Sure. Uh, through the chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Paul Raftis, General Manager, Senior Services. I didn't think you needed to be long term chair. Oh, everybody else. <laughs> well, I need an introduction, that's for sure. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there are a number of members of my team here today um, yes. who have worked on this uh, omnibus report. Uh, we have Dana Talk here, who is the director responsible for all of our support services, uh, IT finance, uh, capital projects. Suchin Kakuda, who is our clinical lead and has focused uh, on the actual model of care that's uh, within here, and various other members of uh, my team. Um, so uh, I won't introduce everyone, but maybe afterwards we, have time. we can, we can we talk just about kidding. that. <laughs> Thank so, you, Mr. Um, uh, I'll go through this fairly quickly. I put together uh, a number of slides. Uh, we're very excited about this particular report. And you'll remember that Dr. Pat Armstrong, who is here with us, uh, in the room today was our expert consultant uh, that developed the report uh, and recommendations around creating a new model of care uh, for the City of Toronto's long-term care homes um, that included uh, an emotion-focused uh, approach, uh, increased staffing levels, uh, a focus on relationships within those homes, um, consistent uh, caregivers for, ref for residents, uh, as well as really improving education and training. And one of the things that we want to talk about is really becoming a centre of excellence here in the City of Toronto. Um, and also um, really addressing the significant diversity uh, within, the t within the city's homes. Uh, the next slide describes the various models of care that are out there. And what our team has done here is they have looked at all eight models and taken really the best components, in our view, of all eight models to develop a singular model for the City of Toronto to address the issues that were discussed on the previous slide. And they've done an excellent job with that. Um, and the hallmark of 
um, this on slide four is really, um, Mr. Chair, to your uh, quote from Bob Marley, uh, the individuals who feel it know it the best. And it's really about improving uh, resident care and their feelings around how they're treated in the homes and addressing resident diversity. So you will know that we have people uh, that range in age from 18 to 102. This is not all about uh, dementia and Alzheimer's. We have many different medical issues going on, uh, head injuries, neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, also, uh, we have folks from 70 different countries of origin. They speak 59 different languages and uh, really have 43 different face. Uh, gender identity, all of these things are a big issue for us. And so in developing this model, we wanna make sure that it is absolutely inclusive and addresses the needs of everyone in our homes. On slide five, uh, quickly, it's all about, as I had mentioned earlier, centers around the resident and their families, and it's built off of our values, compassion, accountability, excellence, and respect. And all of these components will really address uh, the issues that we have uh, just talked about. Um, another hallmark of the engagement in Su Ching really deserves um, uh, a lot of credit for this is stakeholder engagement. And uh, we've actually talked to more than 1,500 people about this model, and uh, we're really excited. Uh, all of these folks are excited about this, and we're not going to stop that stakeholder engagement as we implement this pilot. We are going to continue to work with uh, folks in the homes, our residents, families, staff, but also our community partners and academics to really get this right before we roll it out over a, a number of years into the future. And that leads us to slide seven, talks about we recommend a 12-month pilot at Lakeshore Lodge, uh, which is a, an outstanding home. It's one of our smaller homes. Uh, and the, w the reason that we had picked this, we, act, we asked our smaller homes to come and present to us and tell us why they should have the opportunity to implement this pilot. And uh, all of them did a great job, but this team at Lakeshore Lodge were so enthusiastic about it and they really convinced us that they would make it successful. And so that's why we chose that home. Uh, it has a great resident diversity there, um, 30 year olds to uh, over 100, uh, all of the components you had uh, looked at earlier. We also approached Dr. Lynn McDonald and Dr. Raza Mirza, who Dr. Mirza is here today with us uh, and from the University of Toronto, and they have agreed to independently evaluate and review this pilot over the 12 month period of time. Again, with our intention here is to get this right before we roll it out uh, to all of the homes. We move then to uh, slide eight, and it talks about the need really for a multi-year uh, staffing plan. We do ask to increase um, the number of staff in the homes, and it's been a long-standing ask since, since the Sharkey report um, to move from 3.5 average number hours of care to uh, four hours of care per resident. And uh, over a six year period, this would equate to 280 staff. It's important to note that these are all frontline staff that are focused on direct care. And um, we did it over a six year period uh, to really try and focus on making it affordable. And obviously we're going to have to uh, work very closely with the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care, um, and we work very well with them, but to talk about future funding strategies as we move forward, uh, you will note that they do pay 80% of the current um, funding for our long-term care homes. Slide nine simply talks about training and education. Again, I think it's really important for Tr the City of Toronto to be leaders and we have, the team has done an outstanding job in the past and we want to build on that success and we want to become a center of excellence. Uh, we would like to uh, really focus on this emotional wellness, um, new care skills for dementia and disability, again, prioritizing diversity, inclusion, and equity, and promoting flexibility within the homes. If a, if a resident would like to go outside um, to experience the outdoors at a particular moment, we want to uh, allow staff the flexibility to be able to step in and, and do that and really make it a home-like environment. 
Um, slide 10, I, I spoke briefly about the uh, funding strategy. Really, it's about uh, working this over a six year period and bringing it back every year to the budget process for year over year approval. So this report does not ask for blanket approval for the next six years. Uh, it asks to come back through the budget process year over year. Slide 11 is an important slide. Um, you'll recall that um, uh, in EMS, we um, implemented an electronic health record a number of years ago and it was transformative in terms of being able to understand uh, the business and this team has done an outstanding job this year uh, really driving to implement an electronic health record. All 10 homes will be completed by the end of the year and we do believe that this will be transformative uh, for the organization, allow us to really get into the, the details of what goes on and what works and what doesn't, but also allow more time for staff to be with residents and not uh, sitting at, at desks in offices uh, filling out paperwork. Slide 12 talks about the redesign of the physical environment, again moving from an institutional feel to more of a home feel and so we will have our experts uh, work with us and help us to do this but make this a much more welcoming um, environment. Slide 13, which is an important slide, it is in the um, report as well, talks about the capital renewal plan that has been approved by Council both in May of 2015 and May of 2018. It does identify the five homes that do need to be redeveloped in the coming number of years and obviously uh, funding for this is a, is a challenge but it is something that um, we will need to work with the province on in the coming years. Slide 14, this is just a projected timeline for capital redevelopment. It's really an information slide. And slide 15, um, Andrea Austin is sitting here with us. She has done an amazing job with the Toronto Senior Strategy, uh, recently joined our team. And uh, it's really exciting to say that in terms of 2.0, of the 27 recommendations, 15 are fully implemented and 12 are partially implemented. Um, so exciting progress here. We'll continue to drive this forward as we've expanded the mandate uh, within the division. Um, and if I may, um, Via Malia, uh, Director of Operations to my right, who acted as the Interim General Manager for a period of time, is retiring in a month. She has had an amazing 40-year career in health care, both in acute care and in long-term care. We couldn't be more proud of her, and if we could ask her to stand up and maybe just give her a round of applause, that would be amazing. That's all for me, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you very much for your very informative presentation. This, I saw it the second time and I am continue to be excited about it. So thank you very much, Mr. Sayer, Raptus. Uh, members, um, uh, question, you may just stay there for question. Oh, that's right, we've got some depth, right? Uh, Councillor Grimes is trying to hurry me along. So it's, uh, okay, so we'll have, we've got a couple of speakers, so I'll bring the speakers. So thank you. Um, the first speaker that I have is, um, Tom Warner, uh, Senior Pride Network. Mr. Warner, and I also have uh, Margaret Rodriguez is here as well. Okay, would you both come forward and we'll just have you have a seat. I'm not sure if either of you have been here before to speak. Um, just when you sit, I'll just give you an overview as to the process. Um, so you'll have five minutes to speak. Um, there is a clock to your left that will basically count up to five minutes. Uh, when you, each of you will have five minutes, and so if you need that, that's totally up to you. Once you've concluded your presentation, uh, members of committee may have questions of you, and uh, you will respond to the question however you wish, uh, and that will be the opportunity for the members to question you on your presentation. So, uh, welcome, and uh, I will now begin the clock. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think I, I will be presenting uh, solely on, on okay. this item for the senior. I have both program. names here, so that's good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Thompson, other members of council, city staff, and everyone here this morning, thank you for this opportunity to present to you today on behalf of the Senior Pride Network Toronto. <clears throat> Founded in uh, 2002, 
We are an association of individuals and organizations committed to promoting appropriate services and positive caring environments for elders, seniors, and older persons who identify as two-spirit, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, transsexual, queer, intersex, and other. For this presentation today, we'll use the shorter term two-spirit, queer, and trans seniors. Our membership is composed of service providers, long-term care homes, health care providers, agencies primarily serving seniors, as well as elders, seniors, and older persons who are members of the two-spirit queer and trans communities and other supportive individuals. For many years now, we have worked collaboratively with the City of Toronto on initiatives to positively address the needs and concerns of two-spirit queer and trans seniors who are residents of the city's long-term care homes. We are particularly proud to have participated in providing input and advice in the development of the City of Toronto's toolkit for long-term care facilities, the LGBT toolkit creating lesbian, gay, bisexual, and trans-inclusive and infirming care and services. It's a long title, but it's a good toolkit. Um, Earlier this year, we presented our recommendations to uh, City of Toronto senior staff for the supports and measures that should be embedded in a new long-term care model to meet the needs of two-spirit, queer, and trans seniors living in long-term care homes. We are here today to express our enthusiastic support for the development of the proposed emotion-centered approach to care and the implementation plan set out in the recommendations to City Council. We are confident that the proposed emotion-centered approach to care will not only transform the long-term care system and thereby make the lives of seniors who reside in long-term care homes significantly better, we believe it will also provide the model that will meet the specific needs of and provide the supports required for two-spirit, queer, and trans seniors living in long-term care homes. Currently, two-spirit, queer, and trans seniors are more likely to lack adequate social support, in particular emotional support, than other seniors. For two-spirit, queer, and trans seniors, social isolation and lack of support systems are significant factors that negatively impact their health and their well-being. Opportunities to meet other two-spirit, queer, and trans seniors for social and cultural interaction are limited and programs, activities, and events specifically geared towards them are rare. All of these needs and concerns can be addressed in the emotion-centered approach to long-term care, transforming the lives of two-spirit, trans, and queer seniors. The Senior Pride Network hopes to continue to work collaboratively with the city during the development and implementation of this exciting new approach to care. Specifically, we can offer our assistance in the development of inclusive policies and practices that recognize the diversity of two-spirit, queer, and trans communities and that are tailored to positively responding to the unique issues, special needs, and primary concerns of two-spirit, queer, and trans seniors. As we have done in the past, we would be pleased to provide input and advice in the development of training materials and toolkits for the staff of the city's long-term care homes, focusing on the specific needs of two-spirit, queer, and trans seniors from an emotion-centered approach. And we would be pleased to provide input and advice for the design of the pilot project at Lakeshore Lodge. Uh, in conclusion, we thank you for listening to our presentation today on behalf of two-spirit, queer, and trans seniors in the city of Toronto, and look forward to seeing the emotion-centered approach to long-term care become a reality in the city's long-term care homes. Thank you, Thank you very much uh, for your presentation, sir. Uh, questions for Mr. Warner? Uh, just a quick one from me, sir. Um, yes. So, gather from what you've stated, uh, the process that you have engaged in as part of this report uh, identifies and address some of the needs, or, or is it all the needs, or as best as the report can, the needs of the community that you have expressed that you represent as part of this network, the Pride Network? 
Yeah, we think that the, the emotion-centered uh, approach that's been described uh, would address the particular needs and concerns of, of, of member, uh, senior members of our communities. Uh, yes, uh, we believe it will be important to ensure through uh, the development of the training models and, and training programs and uh, through some policies and procedures uh, that there's a particular um, uh, focus or attention given to the uh, special needs of, of, of queer and uh, two-spirit and, and trans seniors. But yes, overall, we believe that this approach will address those. And, and is there, or can you see, Claire, that on-ramp uh, to access to ensure that the group is fully engaged as part of this process? Is that sort of understanding in terms of how to continue to be engaged? Is that clear to you? I, I believe I believe so. I mean, we are in uh, communication and contact with the right. I just want to say, right. sometimes that happens, but oftentimes right. people say, "Well, you know, I'm not really sure that it's as um, as impactful as it could be, or there's some type of element that maybe denotes some type of resistance." So, and I just wanted to make sure, in terms of clarity, that there's none of that. That there is an no. open opportunity for discussion and engagement, for input, and the toolkit of information that you could offer to help us as part of, you know, um, this process to ensure that um, the emotional component part of care and how that's going to be introduced as part of this report is, um, it, 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 you have the access. Yes. Fantastic. Yes, we have the access. Yeah. Fantastic. There's no, no, no uh, questions and, there, no? Yes, Okay. Thank you both very much. There are no further questions of, uh, of you from members of committee. Thank you both very much for your presentation. Thank you. All right. Members, question of staff. Question. Okay. That's <laughs> Vice Chair Grimes. Question of staff. And I'll come back to you, Michael. Yeah. Yes. I'm going to counsel Cressy. Question of staff. Um, yeah. So, um, in the presentation, uh, Mr. Raftis, you showed us, uh, I think, how many models, eight or nine models you looked at. And I know I did get briefed on it, but how did we arrive at the model that you thought was the best model to arrive at? Through the chair, thank you for the question. Um, so our uh, staff, uh, working with a number of different folks, looked at all of the different models. We had taken the recommendations from Dr. Armstrong in terms of what the components of the model should be. We really looked, we took the best components from all eight existing models and built one model specifically for Toronto to address the uh, recommendations from Dr. Armstrong's um, report. So in those stakeholders you talked, I think it was 1,500 and some people you talked to that. So it's a made for Toronto model, what you're bringing forward. Through the chair, that is correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then and, and also in your presentation when we met, you know, the, the range 18 to 102 when you, you know, the ages from 18 years old to 102, you really don't think of the long-term care when you're thinking of, you know, you think 18 years older in, in, these, uh, in these homes too. It's kind of remarkable the diversity you have of the care that Right. Through, the, through the chair, that's correct. And I mean, we, we used to, you'll remember, call them lo um, homes for the aged. But uh, in fact, it's not the case. It is, the, these are um, organizations that, or institutions that really are looking after people for a long period of time because they have chronic care needs. And so you could have an 18-year-old with, with a head injury that requires a certain level of care for the rest of their life living in one of our long-term care homes. So we want to really move from the medical-focused model to more of a social um, support model um, and more of a home-like environment uh, and connect with those residents and really have them feel like they're living at home. Yeah, so give me just touch also on that extra half hour. It doesn't seem like... Three and a half to four doesn't seem like a lot. It's it's it's, it's a huge hit to our budget. But can you maybe explain what that extra half hour, what that means? Through the chair, absolutely. So um, it is a little bit confusing because we had to point <clears throat> to a specific industry ask the three and a half hours to four hours, but really that's an average. So there are some very high functioning individuals within the long-term care setting that might need only two hours of care, but there may be others or there are others who have very deep needs and may require six hours of care a day. So so we will tailor um, the care specific to the individual and the increased number of hours will go to the individuals who require the most amount of care and um, also in terms of training staff to really connect and build those relationships with those individuals. Great. 
And I was happy to hear in, in uh, your briefing to me, Lakeshore Lodge came up, uh, <clears throat> a great facility in my ward, um, and, 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 it was, and it's 150 beds, I think, in there, which is one of the smaller ones, could possibly why we're doing the pilot project there. Um, so we're going to do, do the pilot project, but what is the life of Lakeshore Lodge? Um, through the chair, so Lakeshore Lodge is uh, on the redevelopment list. Um, and so it is one of the uh, homes that we want to redevelop in the coming years. And so we will be sensitive as we do the, the pilot there not to spend too much money on the redesign of the interior. We will make it more home-like. Uh, paint, decorations, those types of things. But really, um, it's a priority for redevelopment, and so we will need to work with the city to look for uh, a site for redevelopment. So we don't own that site. My next question, we don't own that site, correct? Through the chair, that's correct. Humber College owns that site, and we just lease the space. And they're, in just, they're interested in maybe looking at that site for, for themselves, correct? Through so chair, with correct. that, I think you guys are facing the same challenges as the school boards are, which I'm not going to get into that, you know, divesting properties, but you know, where would you find a location for Lakeshore Lodge? It, like, that's a challenge, correct? Yeah, through the chair, it is a, it is a challenge because there are minimum um, uh, requirements for building. So we're looking at uh, a minimum of uh, 5,000 square meters. How many um, beds is, would that be, Paul? Is the minimum site. So we're looking for a site that would be like five acres. So if you're building a new home, how many beds would you be looking to put into that new home? Ideally, you would be looking with, with uh, Council's approved plan and adding the 978 beds that, that they've asked the organization to, to, or the division to add. You'd be looking at approximately 400 beds. And the other thing that we want to do um, um, through the Deputy Mayor is when we want to make sure we're working with other divisions so that we fully take advantage of the site. And so as an example, maybe we work with EMS and a multifunction station. Maybe we work with affordable housing to put affordable housing above um, um, the long-term care facility. So, uh, you know, uh, really building a community hub in the way that we have with the GSR project. So we have a full continuum there. We have a community hub, transitional housing, an emergency shelter, uh, affordable housing, and 378 long-term care beds all in one site. So would you, last Thank question, you. last question. So it'd be safe to say you're challenged at finding these sites to, to find five acres to, to make this, and have your, so in these operations, they're few and far between, correct? Through the chair, that is correct. Thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you very much, Vice Chair Grimes. Uh, Councillor Ford. Question. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, Councillor Grimes asked a couple of uh, really good questions that I uh, was going to ask, so I'm going to kind of jump along here. Um, so particularly to page 13 of the report, <clears throat> um, we, it has shown that uh, we have a graph here on figure four, the city's long-term care bed inventory. So with the, uh, the, the recommended model um, that, you are, that uh, the division is putting forward, um, in terms of cost, the cost is $24 million upon full implementation? Through the chair, that is correct. It's important to note, it, it seems like a big number, um, but because the system is so large, we provide a million resident days a year. So it's about $24, six, you know, over that six-year period uh, per resident day. Okay, and with those uh, numbers, are, are you, have you taken into account uh, uh, the City Council's adopted goal of the increase of 37%? Um, to 2030. Uh, that's what the graph is on page 13. Um, through the chair. So the in terms of the 978 uh, beds that uh, we've been asked to include in the capital plan, those those are not uh, funded at the moment. They are included in the capital plan, but those are not included in the $24 million that not, you see in the report. Necessary. That's correct. Okay. And then uh, a very particular question, uh, just uh, this question popped into my mind while looking at the graph. Um, in, in particular in North Etobicoke, um, we made an investment into Kipling Acres, which expanded the number of beds um, a few years back. Um, but here it doesn't show any change in occupancy. Was that, or in the uh, amount of beds that the city has? Um, is that supposed to be reflected in the data or? Um, 
through the chair. So there, there actually wasn't an expansion with, with Kipling Acres. There was, it was actually reduced down to 145 and then with phase two back right. up to the 300 and change. So the, the 2641 that we operate is this, has been the same number for many, many years. That remained, but then in phase two, beds were added back onto the... That's correct. We actually had right. to close beds, which was a reduction. And then we added them back added for them the back in. That's correct. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, and so when you look at current staffing levels right now, um, I think Councillor Grimes asked this question, um, but how do you currently staff? Is it by a ratio um, of staff uh, uh, to people living in the home, um, or you mentioned the needs base. Um, so how do we do that currently? So uh, through the chair, um, we staff based on the ministry funding currently. So we maximize the ministry funding, mm -hmm. and then by the unit, we end up applying staff to, you know, obviously people who have more needs do get a little more care and people who have fewer needs um, have less care, but it's driven by the actual ministry funding and that 3.5 hours of care. In the 3.5 hours. That's correct. Right, which you are taking on to the four hours if we adopt this. Through the chair, that's that's the recommendation in the report. Now, this might be a hard question uh, for, for, for you to answer. It might be more better directed at the province, but when you said our, the approach we're taking or the model you're recommending is very Toronto-centric, um, from a provincial lens, um, different municipalities have different ways of approaching the care that they give to their uh, residents who, who live in the long-term care homes. Um, have you gotten any feedback from the province on how they're going to be approaching their investments in long-term care, which they've been speaking about, uh, particularly to this? Through the chair, uh, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to speak for the province, but I know that the province has been looking at different models of care for, for a period of time now. Some other municipalities have implemented um, specific models of care uh, within their municipalities, um, but the province has not mandated a specific model. So I think many people in the industry will be very interested in this model. Right. I think it will be groundbreaking, and I think that um, it is part of the evolution of the uh, long-term care industry. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Light, question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't know whether this question is relevant, but being new on council and on this committee, I'm, I'm noticing that uh, Appendix uh, G on the map, I don't have any in my Ward 23. I have no long-term care home there. Uh, how, how does, will, will that be one opening up there? Or I mean, how does this, how is this gonna help? I don't know. <laughs> so through, through the chair, um, there's a large footprint of long-term care homes within the city of Toronto. There are 85 homes. The city though only operates 10. Most of the long-term care homes within the city, almost 16,000 uh, long-term care homes, are either run by the private sector or nonprofit. So we, ha we operate 10. We are not looking to expand to more uh, additional sites. In the redevelopment, it is possible that a site could come up in a ward where there currently isn't a long-term care home. Um, so as an example, uh, Councillor Grimes mentioned Lakeshore Lodge. We cannot use the site that it sits on currently. It's owned by Humber College. So a new site would need to be found for that location. And it's, you know, it's possible that it could switch wards, but we're not looking to go from 10 to 11 uh, if that is the question. Well, in terms of equity, I think I should have one uh, that's run by the city. I do have a, quite a few private, uh, like Ehong, they have a few in my ward there. I'm that's just correct. wondering, you know, why is it because of, uh, we didn't ask for it or, you know, I mean, I don't know how to go about it, but it could be another conversation for another day for that, okay? I'm sure I'm happy to talk to you offline about that. Okay, so I think I do have some good sites too. Okay, okay. Thank, thank you so much, Mr. Thank you very much, Councillor Lai. Um, just a couple of questions for me. Um, I may get three, I don't know, two. Um, so uh, the, the eight models that you reviewed and you've come up with a 
Toronto solution, Toronto model, if I can term it that. So months ago, there was this great fanfare about the butterfly model. So tell me about it. Are the butterflies flying or is the model working? And why aren't we implementing the butterfly model? Uh, through the chair to the chair. Um, so there are, are many great components within the butterfly model, and I'm sure that others are having good success with that model. So I, I wouldn't want to suggest that it's not a good model. Um, when we looked at the different models that were out there and when we worked with Dr. Armstrong, it was really evident that no one model was complete for the city. Uh, when we looked at the resident diversity, all of those different pieces that we had talked about. So we thought that it was uh, wise to really look, take the best components, create a Toronto-centric model, uh, work with, um, uh, you know, really an outside group, uh, the University of Toronto, Dr. McDonald and Dr. Mirza, to um, really validate that it is the right way to go. And so we're doing that and following the pilot, I think that uh, I think we will be successful in showing that it's, uh, it's the best model for the City of Toronto. Thank you. Um, in Appendix F, um, it looks at the wait list and um, there's a, over 5,000 people who are waiting. Um, given the ages and in some cases advanced ages for um, those who are waiting, uh, and you've got uh, that it may take between one and uh, nine years to offer admission, some people can't wait that long because of obvious reasons. So I understand and through the questions to Councillor Lai about the private sector and the number of long-term care homes in, in the city. Um, and you talk about sort of the, um, the network public data and, and so on and the number of beds that's available and so on. So we have a challenge then in terms of trying to accommodate the needs, not dissimilar to other areas in terms of housing, but this is much more acute because, and again, I, I'm sorry to sort of split hairs here, but it's just people who are not able to really take care of themselves and I realize people who are in need of housing, I mean, that's a huge problem as well. But if someone is unable to walk or is unable to feed themselves and so on, there's a bit of a distinction in just in terms of the groups that I'm just identifying. How do we address this fundamentally important problem? And you talk about diversity because there are many people who are, don't have necessarily the resources to go to some of the other facilities that are around. What are you proposing? Um, and I don't sort of see that here as such, but moving forward in the future, is it more facilities being built as Councillor Lai is looking for? How do we address this problem? And I know it's not unique to us, but how, how are we preparing, how are we planning to address this problem? Uh, through the chair, sir, to the chair. Uh, so um, a few things. Um, we need to be really good at our admissions uh, with the existing resources that we have, and I can tell you that we are. So we run at 99% occupancy, 98.9 uh, yesterday. So we make sure that um, in terms of turnover, uh, we do it very efficiently and we take full advantage of the beds that we have. Number two, council has asked us to look at increasing the number of long-term care beds by 978. So um, that's a very significant increase. The last 30 years, uh, there has not been an increase. And so we have put that in our uh, capital plan. And the third thing that we need to do is really focus on how do we support people aging in place and, and living at home. And so uh, we're doing that through the, the Toronto Senior Strategy. We're doing that through working with TCHC Seniors Housing. We're working closely closely with the Lynn and soon to be the Ontario Health Associations to make sure that we get those health services into people's homes to support them to age in place because to your point, Deputy Mayor, I mean we have 400,000, more than 400,000 Torontonians today who are over the age of 65. Uh, by 2041 that'll be 800,000. Uh, we will never be able to build enough long-term care homes to address that need. We'll really need to uh, help people at home. Okay, thank you. And then my final question is the formulation in terms of the 80-20 model um, with the province. Um, uh, in light of some of the changes that has happened with the province, the discussion that uh, put, I'm presuming that there are discussions going on to ensure that that funding formula stays in place, how is that going? 
Uh, through the chair, we have a great relationship with the province. Um, you know, we're working with, with them directly. Funding, um, as with most cost-shared programs, is a year-over-year -year discussion. We were very strategic in how we built out this report, and we focused on efficiencies in 2020, so we had the smallest ask, $500,000, and it's still a significant amount of money, but the, the, the main money comes in future years, so that it would give us time to really try and work on that funding strategy and see if there was uh, more assistance available from the province. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Taking opportunity now, and I know that Councillor Grimes is ready to go. Councillor Grimes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a motion uh, we put up on the screen that the City Council direct create to, to work with seniors services and long-term care to assess the feasibility of financial impacts on the long, including long-term care beds as part of the redevelopment goals of the Six Points Development of Etobicoke as a mixed-use transit-oriented community and request the General Manager of Senior Services and Long-Term Care to report to the Economic Development Community Development Committee on the outcome of this work. And I didn't put a time to come back. I have talked to Paul about that, so uh, I'm sure he'll report back when he can. Um, <clears throat> you just heard uh, Paul say, Council's director will look to find a, another, let's call it 1,000 beds, 978 beds. That's, to me, if you divide that by two in Paul's math, you're looking for five acres of property in a total. Councilor Ford will tell you that's very few and far between. So with that, uh, there's no if, ands, or buts. The properties that are controlled, the three sites that we talked uh, about this morning that Dr. Um, Meng talked about in, in Etobicoke, all the central part of Etobicoke, we have to look at these sites that are controlled by the city in our control because to find five acres of property just for, for Paul's division um, is, is going to be a, a huge, huge task to find that and Paul will tell you that. So Lakeshore Lodge, I was happy to see uh, them on the list, uh, a great a great facility of my ward. I was riding in the Santa Claus Parade with Mayor Tory one time, and uh, we're riding this Saturday. And I said, if we don't stop at Lakeshore Lodge, look up and wave those people. I said, Mr. Mayor, you're going to be in big trouble. So they're always there when we go by in the parade. But it's a fabulous fac facility. My mother-in-law, uh, she's volunteered there. Uh, it's great to see them on the list, to see this pilot project go forward. But I think it's imperative that we look at these sites, and Councillor Ford will tell you, there's three sites up there in Etobicoke, all kind of within... Uh, of each other, I think it would be great to uh, um, have them work uh, with the CREATO and <clears throat> sit down with Paul's division and see if, this, if somehow we can uh, fit some fu future uh, beds in there as Council's direct them to do. So with that, I ask you to support that motion to direct uh, CREATO to work with the Senior Service Long-Term Care. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Vice Chair Grimes. Anyone else to speak? Um, I'll just take a... Oh, Councillor Cressy? I just had one question for Council. Oh, question. Grimes, Sorry, question on the motion. Sorry about that. Um, the motion uh, is for City Council to direct create TO. Are, I just wanted, are we, have we confirmed that we are able to direct or should yep. that be request? Yep. Council can. Council can, as I understand it, direct create TO. They need to be because it's an, sorry, it's an agency, but we can't as a committee, and I think that was the very issue. Okay. But thank you for clarification. That's helpful. And they need uh, to be directed. Madam Clerk. <laughs> Is there, okay. Okay, well, <laughs> thank you. Council Grimes wishes them to be directed, and Council Grimes has drafted the motion to uh, ensure that they are directed uh, by his request of Council. How's that? Okay. Request and directed in both. Um, thank you very much um, for the report. Um, it's an amazing report, actually. Um, the appendix and everything that is in there. Um, we were at a time um, when we were discussing this matter and it appeared that we would never get to a spot where we would be addressing the issues and what model we would land on and so on. And um, it really speaks to the professionalism of Mr. Raftis and the whole team that's actually here and by extension, Dr. Reza and others and the other doctors from the University of Toronto and our collaboration. It's really important in terms of how we use our assets to address issues. There are non, you know, non-government organizations, you know, institutions, academic institutions, and all the professionals in terms of how we collaborate to address fundamental issues that we're facing in the city. Those are the reasons why we're successful, because we're not in abstract and sort of just working in isolation. There was a time when we did that. And it didn't work at all for us, quite frankly. 
And so now I think that with the leadership of Ms. Raftis and others and Madam DCM, thank you as well and thank the team. I want to say that um, our seniors who are, you know, children and our seniors are the most vulnerable members in our society. Uh, children are growing and developing and so we provide the resources and the tools that they need. Our seniors are in uh, many instances in um, uh, required additional extended care and the quality of life that we offer and ensure that they have. Um, in reviewing and, and, and discussing the matter with Mr. Raptus and reviewing the report, it seems to me that we are addressing the issues of all groups. And, um, you know, we had the, the folks who came to speak us from uh, Pride, Pride, Senior Pride Network. Important as to who we are and what we do to ensure that all of our citizens and all of our residents are able to have access to what they need in order to improve their quality of life. I think this is what the report is actually um, uh, speaking to, and I'm, I'm delighted that we have gone and searched out all the models that potentially um, are there and, and that we have landed on a spot where it's something that works in our best interest as a model for Toronto. Notwithstanding that point, there is a number of people that are still on waiting lists, and it's taking um, a tremendous amount of time and so on. If you have to wait, you know, if, you, if I'm 81 years old or something and having to wait another nine years to gain access to long-term care, it's a dire strait situation in terms of where you are and, and how people are positioned and so on. I think that's extremely important in terms of ensuring that we can accommodate and find the beds and find the space and so on. But I, I, I like the fact that you're talking about, you know, aging in place and, and how we help and create that um, environment in the city. And this is work that's continuing to, to be done. Um, the point that Councillor Grimes brought in and part of the report, that extra half an hour. How important is that? And when I first saw it, I thought, does it really matter? Does it make such a difference? And having discussion with Ms. Raftis and so on and realizing it does matter and it will make a big difference. And, you know, the resources, I wish we had the $24 million, we can put it in place today and so on. But being pragmatic, we're going through a process. And I think that's important for us to take that role in that particular position in terms of how we address this fundamental challenge that exists for all of us so that we are able to do better to a vulnerable group of people who need, need the attention, right? And oftentimes some of them are not able to articulate what their needs are. And so it's an assessment process and this is all built into this particular process. So this report is an excellent report. It's very helpful. Going forward, I don't know whether or not there'll be additional recommendations or council coming forward and so on, but I'm looking forward to this being implemented, being funded, and the provincial piece in terms of the relationship, in terms of ensuring that that formulation is there. Because if it's not there, then we are in further, uh, we have further challenge in terms of uh, dealing with this situation. So with that, I want to um, uh, say I'm going to support uh, Councillor um, uh, Grimes' uh, motion and uh, obviously support the, uh, the item in front of us. And I simply want to reiterate and, and just to say to Vijay Malik, uh, thank you so much. And I know you didn't stand before, like you kind of sort of stood up halfway, but I'm gonna ask you to stand and to be really acknowledged because you have this, oh, I know, I know you, well, you have quietly helped us immensely and we wanna loudly uh, laud, laud you out now for all the great work you've done. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. And so with that, um, I want to ask you for a vote on Councillor Grimes' uh, motion. He has asked for a recorded vote, so all those in favor? All those in favor of the amendment, uh, Councillor Cressy, Councillor Grimes, Councillor Thompson, Councillor Ford, and Councillor Lai. The amendment carries. Um, item is amended. All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Thank you. Uh, Madam Clerk, there are no other items left on the agenda. Members of committee, we have completed the agenda. It's now 12 minutes after 12. I want to ask for a motion to adjourn. Councillor Lai, all those in favor, oppose, that's carried. And again, thank you so much to the staff for the outstanding work you've done. Thank you, have a good afternoon, yes. everyone. Madam DCM, thank you so much, thank you.